So I can start now? Yes. Okay. So hello, everybody. So let's start, let's start the opening session of this uh, webinar. Uh, so my name is uh, Pascal Bonham. I am a research scientist at INRAE in France and deputy director of the Safe Food Unit. And I, was, I have uh, co-organized this uh, webinar uh, with uh, Lilian Barros. Uh, from uh, SAIMO, uh, IPB Braganza in Portugal, and I therefore speak on behalf of, of uh, both of us. So thank you for the large audience uh, to this uh, webinar called uh, Novel Food Based on uh, New Ingredients, Materials and Processes, which corresponds to the name of the task we are co-leading with Ilian in the systemic project. So just a, a few figures to, st to start with. Uh, we have uh, nearly uh, 400 uh, registration from uh, 56 countries for this webinar. So including France, Portugal, uh, Spain, Romania, Argentina, Greece, Belgium, Poland, Estonia, Germany, Latvia, Turkey, Morocco, and, and uh, it's, it's a long uh, list. <laughs> So first, I would like to thank all the people who contributed to the organization of this webinar. So thank you for uh, uh, a special thank to the speakers who responded favorably to, to make a talk. A special thank to uh, plenary lecturers, uh, Luca Coccolin from Torino University, Italy, and Daniel Granato uh, from Limerick uh, University, Ireland. So this webinar is organized as part of the Knowledge Hub Systemic on nutrition and food security, as I mentioned before. An important issue in this systemic project is to develop integrated approaches to the challenge of sustainable food systems. So Systemic is organized in several work package and tasks, which are described in more detail in our, on our website. So novel foods are newly developed foods derived from new substrates like uh, raw materials or ingredients, and they are produced using innovative uh, technologies and production processes. They can contribute to possible uh, replacement of food from animal origin, especially ruminants, uh, due to uh, owing to the level of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by more sustainable foods. So we, we identified two main issues uh, for this program. The first one is uh, alternative protein-rich foods, uh, protein being from plant or animal sources, including fermented foods. So uh, fermentation could be, um, may offer a huge potential and could also represent an important field of innovation to design new uh, foods with desirable sensorial, nutritional, and health promoting properties. And another issue is to develop bioactive ingredients from food uh, byproducts and developing bioactive rich food products. So, with Lilian, we decided to organize two sessions for this webinar. I was more specifically, specifically in charge of the morning session called Alternative Protein Rich Fermented Food. And Liliane uh, will be in charge of uh, the afternoon session called Bioactive Ingredient in Foods. So I now give the, the floor to Sylvie Dequin from uh, uh, my institute in RAE, French, uh, which is a French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment. She's head of uh, INRAE MICA department, MICA being uh, meaning uh, microbiology and food chain. So Sylvie, the time is, uh, is yours. 
Okay, thank you, Pascal. Uh, so first of all, I would like to welcome you to this Novel Food Save webinar. And I will uh, say a few words to briefly introduce INRAE and our research in the field of fermented food. So INRAE is the French Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and the Environment. And we address the scientific challenges related to these fields and taking into account, of course, the context of transition that we are currently experiencing. And in the field of food, one of these transition is the need for more sustainable uh, production of healthy foods. So within uh, uh, in RAE and uh, particularly within the microbiology and the food chain division, uh, we are developing research on fermented food since and, and beverage since uh, uh, many years. And we have a lot of experience in traditional fermented food, of course. But today, there is a renewed interest for uh, uh, in fermented food, uh, which represents a particular challenge for a successful transition to a healthier and more sustainable diet. Uh, due to their potential for the consumption of new resources of new sources of protein and particularly plant based protein, but also due to their interest in saving resources and also their role in health and their potential to meet the challenge of a diet suitable for all ages. And so this context, of course, raises new scientific questions and new challenges uh, to which we, we must uh, respond. Uh, so the development of innovative fermented plant foods capable of meet these needs of uh, shift, uh, expectatory dietary shift from animal diet to a more plant-based diet, but also to provide health and sustainable benefits, require first, of course, an in-depth knowledge of microorganisms and their functional capacities. So basically in our labs, uh, we use two main approaches for the development of mixed or full plant fermented products. So, uh, we, we can work on the use of microorganisms traditional use for, for dairy fermentation that we uh, adapt for the fermentation of these new matrices. But we can also uh, try to select new microbial consortia able to carry out uh, the fermentation of, uh, of uh, these new matrices. So in any case, what we need is to know how microorganisms can interact with these new plant food matrices and produce aroma, nutrition, and health factors. So we use synthetic ecology approach uh, based on the reconstruction of ecosystems and on the study of the behavior of these ecosystems to understand their global functioning. And of course, this knowledge uh, will allow the rational design of such uh, microbial communities suitable for the, the fermentation of this uh, new matrix. So another important research area is the interaction of food microbiota uh, with gut microbiota to better understand and predict uh, the potential effect on health. So I will, I will uh, stop there. And so uh, this knowledge and that way, of course, on traditional products uh, will, I'm convinced that they will help us to develop the fermented uh, products, the fermented food of tomorrow. And I look forward to hearing examples of this research through the presentation of uh, this morning. So with that, I wish you an, uh, an excellent and very successful webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Sylvie. So, Lilian, the time is yours. <laughs> thank you, Pascal. So, now we will have some words from Tiago Barbosa, which is the pro president for research and innovation in IPB. Tiago, the screen is yours. Hello, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see me loud and clear. Uh, first of all, I would like to greet my fellow panel members, Secretary of State Prof. Isabel. We are so pleased to have you at this opening ceremony for all the guidance and support you have been providing to our region here far afield. Pascal and Sylvie, we at IPB, we are really glad to have you as partners in this endeavor and as representatives of the remaining partners of this consortium, allow me to extend my greetings to all of them. And finally, again, Pascal and Lillian, Congratulations to you two, to your teams, to Simo, and all the partners for putting up together yet again another wonderful webinar. Uh, secondly, a very welcome to all the attendees. 
especially for those far away from uh, Bragança. I wish you could have had a chance of traveling here to interact face to face, but also to enjoy the best of our campus, our city, our region, such as, for instance, well, the food, right? No surprise here the breathtaking landscape or our very unique culture among, among others. Well, anyway, we are living in a brave new world in the sense of a new period of major disrupt disruptive changes in our society. And rest assured, when I say a brave new world, I'm not talking the one by Huxley or Shakespeare, okay? I'm talking in these changes that we are living today, mostly, that were uh, sped up or triggered by the pandemic. We are really on a fast track lane towards the digital world that enhances collaboration and sharing of capacities where um, economic drive must be underpinned by research and innovation. And there is no best way, no best way to showcase these my assertion than these webinar that we are attending today. Again, in this, our brave new world that must be sustainable, sustainable, must address emerging societal changes and must involve the academia, the industry, government and civil society. And we can see that happening again today, where results are explored and yield a positive impact, a positive return for our communities. And the novel food work package and this consortium are outstanding examples on how we should move forward. And lastly, because I don't want to take too much time, this brave new world must make us much closer where one can reach out, talk, work, collaborate with anyone out there at the distance of, of a mouse click or a tap on the handphone. And for, for instance, today, I just learned that we are going to be at least virtually in Italy, in France, Ireland, Spain, Latvia, Germany, and Portugal. I hope I have not forgotten any other country. Otherwise, my, my deep apologies. So cities and regions are competing for the most cutting edge, the most innovative and disruptive organizations at regional, national, and international scale. And thus, what they are doing are attracting highly qualified collaborators, highly qualified residents for the, those cities. And how do they do that? By providing business-friendly environments, generous paychecks, and quality of life for those collaborators and foes for those residents. This is one of the ways of tackling something that is a huge challenge for us in Europe, which is the demographic and the economic downturn. And most of our regions out of these 400 plus attendees, we faced this. Still, Bragança is also in the same boat. We are doing our best to provide the blueprint on how to achieve the vision I just told you, where this brave new world is shaped also by people that are environment minded, for instance. And so to say, and to summarize that many of them are here with us today as partners of the consortium and this package, as members of the organizing committee of this webinar, sharing sessions, delivering talks, as co-authors, or just keen to attend to insightful talks. So my, my last note is to all of you. You are the ones, we are the ones who make this uh, vision of a new world come true, a world that is underpinned by research and innovation providing quality of life for everyone. So yeah, that was in summary my message, that the message that I would like to convey today at the opening ceremony of this webinar, that this webinar, this event, this work package, and this consortium are stepping stones for an ever-changing landscape, and notably of what is going to happen, hopefully, when this pandemic goes away. So yeah, I hope you enjoy this day of sharing. Back to you, Pascal. Back to you, Lillian. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you for your words. Um, now I want to present our Secretary of State for the uh, Inland Improvement, uh, um, Isabel Ferreira. First of all, I would like to thank you so much for your busy schedule and for being for, here with us today. Um, before being in the government, Isabel was a, 
a, a top scientist in, in novel foods. And that's why I wanted her to be here with us and to give us also some, some brief words. So thank you so much. And uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. My compliments to, to Pascal and Sylvie from INRAE, to Lillian and Tiago from IPV, and congratulations for the organization of this uh, webinar. Uh, in fact, food systems uh, face important challenges in the current context, particularly to provide food with guaranteed quality, safety and security. And there is a significant number of factors such as uh, process scalability, alignment with circular economy guidelines and contribution to digital and climatic transition that should be continuously fulfilled. Portugal, uh, our country, is in the right track, holding uh, several research centers, collaborative laboratories, associated laboratories, interface centers that are fully dedicated to complementary fields of food research. And independently of its specific research focus, all these units, all these uh, research units are set to foster a balance between the production schedule necessary for the internationalization of food gods, uh, essential for the economic empowerment of the regions, but also the commitment to short production and distribution chains with obvious benefits considering the objective of carbon neutrality. And there is a mandatory compliance with the assumptions of circular economy, either in the reduction of waste uh, and surpluses throughout the agri-food value chain, as also in fulfilling other requirements associated with the concepts of innovation and food sustainability. In other case, and despite the, the significant work developed around the, the technological improvement of food, there is a constant need of increasing the awareness of the general public for the benefits of healthy diets and direct effects on health promotion, producing indirect social and economic gains. And recently, it has been verified a strong investment in functional foods, superfoods, nutraceuticals, which represents a new added value with great potential for food produ producers. And uh, Simu and also Lillian research team uh, uh, is uh, uh, well known over the world in these thematics. And in this scope, some of the main research topics include food function and its relationships with food structure, food composition, innovative food materials such as bioactive substances, alternative protein and novel food ingredients uh, and also associated health benefits. Other relevant research trends include also new food packaging produced with more sustainable materials with a higher level of labeled information. And in addition to packaging, other advances in food engineering and manufacturing technologies related to processing, uh, preservation or digital transformation are equally in progress. Most of these new developments of innovative food products and processes result from uh, fruitful partnerships between higher education institutions, interface entities of the scientific and technological system and industrial companies. This collaborative work has been providing important advanced technological applications either employing nanoscience and biotechnology, but also applying different omic techniques. In all processes, food quality and safety must be completely assured, complying with food traceability and authenticity purposes, 
and risk uh, assessment of chemical and or biological hazards. Finally, all the, the cited processes should define the necessary support to achieve new policies and regulation associated with, with food systems. For all of these, I am sure that it will be an excellent opportunity for all of you to discuss all these topics within this webinar. So congratulations for this organization and thank you very much. Thank you thank so you. much. Okay. Yes, let's, uh, now we can uh, move to, to the first uh, uh, a presentation uh, by uh, Luca Cocolin. So maybe uh, the chairs will, uh, will start. Yes. So now we will have a chair, which is Sandrini Lino, which will chair this first plenary lecture. Okay, thank you. Good morning to everyone. So let's start our scientific program with the first topic, which is the alternative protein rich fermented foods. My name is Sandrina, and before presenting our first uh, plenary lecture, I just want to remind you that if you have any questions, you can perform them in, the, in our um, YouTube chat, and then we can address them to our speakers. So moving on, it is my pleasure to present you all um, Professor Luca Cocolin. Professor Luca is a full professor of food microbiology in the Department of Agricultural forest and food sciences at the University of Torino, Italy. He has published until now more than 350 publications in international journals. Uh, he is also an executive board member of the International Committee on Food Microbiology, part of the International Union of Microbiological Societies. He is also a member of the leadership team of the European Technology Platform Food for Life. And he is also the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Food Microbiology. So, Professor Luca, welcome to this webinar. I remind you that you have about 35 minutes for your plenary speech, and then we will have about five minutes for um, any questions we, we may have. So, when you are ready, you can start. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandrine, for the, for the introduction. Let me just... Uh, set up the technical aspects. So just give me the confirmation that you can see properly my, my presentation and then I can go. It's fine. Okay, great, fine. thank you very much. So uh, before, before starting, let me, let me uh, thank the organizers and in particular Pascal and also Lilian, uh, not only for giving me the opportunity to present uh, uh, some of the research or some of the uh, ideas that we have about uh, food fermentation and how food fermentation can actually um, improve or help um, uh, addressing the problems that we are facing at the moment, but but also for letting me get in touch with this uh, community of the uh, systemic uh, project, because um, I think that uh, um, in Europe, there are a lot of different initiatives that they are uh, actually working towards reaching results that would help us addressing the, the, the actual situation. And through collaboration, I think that we can really um, hit the objective of improving the sustainability and improving the way we are nowadays producing foods. Um, the other thing that I want to say before starting um, is that um, I did not at all um, align with what Sylvie has said, but actually Sylvie, and I want to, to, to say hello to her. I mean, it has been a long time that we are not, we are not in contact, but um, she actually, properly outlined 
the presentation that I'm going to be um, I'm going to be showing to you or I'm going to be talking to you today. So uh, thanks also to Sylvie for, to properly put in place all the different concepts that you will hear in the next in the next half an hour or so. So um, as you can see from the first slide, my topic today is about food fermentation. Food fermentation is one of my long time uh, uh, loves in, uh, uh, by the point of view of the, 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 the research that we are doing in, in my laboratory here at the University of Turin, because we really believe that food fermentation is something that can really give us a lot of different possibilities, a lot of different opportunities and can help us uh, towards at least trying to address some of the issues that we are facing at the moment. And um, the first slide that I want to show you is this one. And I like it very much because um, to me, just looking at this slide, somehow you are like uplifting. Uh, look at the colors, look at the diversity, look at the different uh, types of foods that we can uh, actually identify within the um, fermented foods. Fermented foods are coming from a lot of different uh, um, uh, sources, a lot of different raw materials. And this is probably one of the, uh, let's say, best features that fermented foods have in a sense that through the activities of microorganisms, we can really try to um, get advantage of the um, properties that we can find in specific um, raw materials and they can be leveraged towards foods that can have important um, characteristics, both at the level of the, uh, let's say from the hedonistic point of view, because as consumers, we don't have to forget that um, taste aspect is one of the main or are one of the main drivers, right, that uh, will allow us to choose and to consume certain foods. But uh, as you have heard from Sylvie, and as you will hear also from, from my talk uh, in a little bit, fermented foods, they have also started to be considered important um, foods that can have an impact on, on, on human health. Um, without saying that nowadays, really, we have a lot of opportunities. For instance, when we are talking about plant-based fermented foods or plant-based foods, um, we are at the moment exploiting a very, very low percentage of the plant species that are available on our planet by uh, the point of view of uh, um, uh, the, 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 the production of food. So there is a huge potential. Of course, there are challenges that we need to, uh, to address and we need to overpass. And by this point of view, science will really allow us or will really help us to give the um, somehow solutions or to give the information through which these problems can be addressed. Uh, we are talking today about fermentation and uh, I'm always somehow, um, let's say, smiling when I read and when I hear about fermentations as the last, um, let's say, uh, the last, the last uh, um, discover or the last landscape that has to be that has to be discovered and has to be explored. Also, because if we go a little bit back in the history, fermentation is among the uh, technologies that have been exploited. Um, in history, uh, and it is very well connected to the development of the, uh, the, 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 the human being in our planet. So uh, those are just very simple examples on how fermented foods were um, already known, most probable as empiric um, processes, uh, back in 7000 BC, and this is very well connected to the processes of domestication of animals. So when animals started to be domesticated, also the exploitation of their products started to be uh, started to, to 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 become, let's say, available. So we have uh, dairy dairy products that are associated with the domestication of uh, bovines or ovines in in Iraq. Then very famous the discovery 
of bread and wine and beer also in, in the Egyptians. Uh, we have production of fermented sausages in the Babylonians, and then we have fermented vegetables in, in China. But for sure, those processes that were applied um, mostly empirically, they started to become scientifically um, explained or scientifically explored in the 19th, in the in the 20th century, in the last in the last millennium. So um, we have, of course, uh, very important figures like uh, Louis Pasteur and Alan Mechnikov that um, started to put the basis for the um, exploitation of fermentation in different types of, um, let's say, aspects of our life. Uh, for sure, uh, Louis Pasteur, uh, important for the explanation of the fermentation process. Um, I always uh, like very much to um, refer uh, the discovery of pasteurization, not to stabilize the milk, but let's remember that pasteurization was first invented for the stabilization of the wine. So when we are talking about pasteurization nowadays, it's a process that is absolutely very well established in the dairy sector, or in the milk sector, but let's not forget that it has been applied for the first time in wine. Then we have, of course, Mechnikov, the, I would say, uh, one of the first uh, um, scientists that uh, started to investigate the relationship between uh, certain beneficial uh, microorganisms contained in fermented foods like milk fermented in, 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 uh, in, um, in Bulgaria and the fact that they could have an impact on human health. But only at the end, let's say, of the 19th, of the, the 20th century, we can start to have a real exploitation of uh, the uh, fermentation with the discovery, or actually with the first design of uh, starter cultures in food fermentations, and with the uh, huge sector that has been opening up uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the at the end of the, um, the, the, the 20th century with the story of the probiotics so this is somehow um, a kind of a roadmap or a little bit of history that puts me into the context of you know understanding how fermentation is developing because uh, we can say that in the in the new millennium fermentation has really acquired a new dimension that can be really exploited or can be really leveraged. It is also uh, very interesting from my side or from my point of view to link food fermentation to cultures. And food fermentation somehow can be really linked to the life cycle, especially, especially in the past when there were certain operations or certain procedures uh, related to the uh, collection of raw materials that were very well linked to food fermentations. Uh, consider, for instance, the uh, harvest of the grapes and then the fermentation for the production of the wine, uh, the harvest of the olives uh, and then the fermentation of the olives, but also, you know, the processes of killing the, 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 the animals at home, like for instance, the, 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 the pork, that was seen as a kind of, you know, very uh, typical, typical aspect of the, of the, of the um, rural life. And um, I would say that it's not actually uh, by chance that the animal was killed uh, uh, towards Christmas, because consider that in Christmas, the temperatures were also very low and would allow for fermentation of sausages, for instance. So apart from the fact of having the meat for, for, for the celebrations, but the conditions that could uh, can, that that could be established at that specific time of the year would also allow the production of fermented foods. So again, to me, fermented foods they are also going out from the dimension of the let's say of, of science itself, but is also getting very much into the social dimension and how those have really played an important role in the development and in the social development of human beings. It's also nice to somehow 
understand how fermented foods are distributed worldwide. And this map clearly underlines how food and fermented foods are strongly related to the natural resources that the single territories and the single geographic areas have at disposal to be transformed. So you can see, for instance, that in Africa, we have uh, the majority of the products that are coming from uh, elaboration or transformation of, uh, um, of cereals. You can see that in the north of Europe, you have a, a kind of, uh, let's say, importance of both dairy, but also fish products. And uh, nice to underline how in Asia, for instance, you have a predominance, so you have a lot of products that are coming from fish, but they are coming also from other origins that are less exploited in the rest of the world, like for instance, the legumes or the fruits. So this is, you know, a nice interpretation or in any case is a nice explanation on how fermented foods have developed throughout the world. Uh, taking into consideration what was the raw material that had to be transformed. But we don't have to forget that there are also some other products that uh, again are uh, super important in some specific regions and probably, and not probably, but often the consumer does not, or the citizen even better, does not really know about it. So we have products like the cocoa or the coffee that have been in our tradition, have been in our diet forever, but only now we start to take uh, or to, to, to get acquired on the fact that also those products are fermented and without the fermentation, we could not reach this specific uh, or the specific characteristics that they have both at the level of the chocolates, for instance, but also on the coffee that we are drinking in, uh, in the morning or throughout, throughout the day. So again, fermentation has really acquired a new dimension in at least the consideration that uh, uh, citizens first, but also then scientists are, uh, let's say, um, are using or in any case are um, putting as an attention. Fermentations by the metabolic point of view can be really considered as factories. So you have raw materials, here you have practically those that have been uh, very much used in the, in, in the tradition or in the history. So you have milk, you have meat, uh, flour that is coming from different cereals and also vegetable products. Here you have olives, but you can have also a lot of different uh, raw materials. And through fermentation, through the exploitation of the metabolism of the microorganisms that are responsible for the transformation, you can get fermented products. And the fermented products are really an important part of the, our diets. And uh, they are really, let's say, responsible for uh, uh, nutritional sustainability because they give us uh, proteins, but they give us also a lot of different compounds that are very important for, for the nutrition. And they are also, let's say, addressing the hedonistic aspect. And so we are really looking for specific organoleptic characteristics when we are consuming, for instance, a cheese from uh, uh, from uh, uh, raw milk that is coming from a, a small factory in the south of France, for instance, or in the north of Italy, just to say that, you know, we are, we are actually very close by the geographical point of view. So fermentation, again, is a kind of uh, um, uh, complex network of interactions where metabolic activities are going on and where uh, we can really find solutions to address the, the issues that we were talking before. And fermentation have also attracted uh, the, the, the attention of also very, very important uh, journals and scientific journals. Uh, but here I want to highlight how, when you are talking about fermentations, we need to get into the dimension of ecosystems because microorganisms in fermentations are always, uh, let's say, in mixed cultures. So we are talking about 
communities. We are not talking about single cultures. So those communities together, they are interacting, they are talking to each other. And through this kind of uh, a concertation, we have products that possess a specific taste, a specific um, organoleptic characteristics and a specific, a specific aspect. Not to forget here, the important connection that uh, um, microbiology must have with the technology, because when we're talking about fermented foods, those two elements should not be uh, forgotten, because we can reach a specific characteristics in fermented foods, like uh, sausage here, or cheeses, or, or drinks, only if we have the right technological conditions or the right, let's say, environmental conditions that are uh, driven by the technology for the production of those fermented foods. So again, this is another element of complexity that we need to take into consideration when we are trying to address the, um, the study of fermented foods. So again, uh, we need to switch from single cultures to communities. What are the benefits of fermented foods and why fermented foods in the last uh, five years have been really um, going into the spotlight? Um, there are a lot of myths behind fermented foods. There are some that I'm going, I, I would like to address with you today, but for sure, when we're talking about fermented foods, the benefits that they have uh, really uh, go into the different uh, domains that you see here in the slide. So uh, for sure, fermented foods, they are helping into the uh, digestibility and the absorption of nutrients because there are a lot of enzymes that are coming both from the raw material, but mostly from the microorganisms that are responsible for the fermentation. And they also give new, um, let's say, nutritional values to the products, like the production, for instance, of certain vitamins. They contain beneficial microbes. I'm not saying that they contain probiotics because I don't want to, to confuse the audience, I prefer to stay to the beneficial microbes, and I'm going to give you as an example uh, later on how this confusion can be created. Fermented foods are safer than the raw materials because during the fermentation, uh, we have a production of lactic acid that uh, uh, really lowers the pH and has an antibacterial activity towards a lot of different microorganisms. And then is also, and by this point of view, is helping on the preservation. So fermented foods have a longer shelf life than consider the, the, the raw materials. And then uh, related to the first aspect that I was telling you uh, is also the fact of the nutritional aspect. And this is for sure something very important. There, be, there has been a lot of interest later uh, towards fermented foods. Why? Because fermented foods are actually products that they contain most of the time a huge number of microorganisms that we are consuming every single day. And from the moment we realize that us as humans, we can be considered as super hosts in a sense that we are containing in our, especially at the level of the gut, but also in other districts of our body, we are containing a lot of microorganisms. The interest of understanding how the microbes that are res residing in our, in our gut and those that are coming with fermented foods can interact with each other started to create a new huge area of research that is the one of the human microbiome microbiota. So by this point of view, we have seen in the last years, a lot of, in, a lot of inputs and a lot of efforts towards understanding how this interaction takes place. And honestly speaking, we have already several evidences. Here you have a paper uh, from, from Marco and collaborators that have been published a couple of patents a, li a little bit many some years ago, where just looking at, uh, you know, doing like a, like a review of uh, the, the, the papers that have been published. I mean, you can really see already that there are uh, several observations or several indications that fermented foods can help. However, what they would say is that we really need to have um, strong 
evidences and correlations and not just observations because one of the, um, the, the, the pitfalls that these studies, most of these studies have is that they are just observed, um, let's say changes in microbiota, for instance, without really looking into the real mechanism that stands behind the improvement of specific disease or the improvement of a health status. So for sure, there is a need for, uh, uh, let's say, um, an increase of efforts towards the understanding on how those interrelations are taking place. And let me just say for at this specific moment that when we're talking about fermented foods, we should absolutely try to avoid the confusion between the word probiotic and the word fermented foods. Uh, unfortunately, I read several times and often that and often that fermented foods should be considered probiotics. This is absolutely not correct. I mean, they can be considered probiotics if they contain probiotic microorganisms, but it's not that if a food is fermented, then you have probiotics in there. And there is a nice, a nice paper that has been published at the beginning of this year where, you know, there is a clear explanation on what should be considered probiotic, what should be considered fermented, and a probiotic fermented food with all the requirements that they need to have in order to properly label, let's say, the, the, the food. So this is something, again, I wanted to just to give you this snapshot because when you are talking about fermented foods, this is something that is happening often. We are here to talk about how fermentations can contribute to this ecological transition. So um, everybody's talking about the unsustainable production systems of animal, on, of animals and animal products. We need to go more into uh, proteins that are coming from plants. So how we can actually use fermentation. Um, we have different possibilities. I mean, we can go for traditional fermentation. So by traditional fermentation here, uh, you know, we are exploiting the processes that have been used for millennia for the production of the fermented foods like uh, cheese, yogurt, wine, beer. And uh, if we go into alternative proteins, we need to go for new raw materials and we need to understand how we can, uh, let's say, act in order to improve flavor and functional functionality. But we can also think about fermentations as biomass production in a way that, you know, you are actually fermenting a product and there is not only the contribution on the um, organoleptic characteristics, but the cells themselves, they can make a food that is rich in specific proteins and is rich in specific, rich in specific uh, nutrients. And then the last one uh, that is also a little bit, uh, you know, very interesting is about precise fermentation. So precise fermentation is actually the use of microorganisms to produce specific functional ingredients. And those functional ingredients, they can come uh, from very different uh, raw materials and secondary raw materials. And here it, it gets into the circular economy and, and circularity of the, of, the, of, of the food system, because we can really exploit uh, products that uh, traditionally or usually are thrown away in order to have a bioprocess that turns them into uh, ingredients that can be used in the uh, food system or in food production. So this is a little bit the, the, the context. Um, I just want to show you some examples or in a case, some opportunities that we have, because when we are talking about plant origin, uh, fermented foods or plant um, rich in proteins, fermented foods, uh, we just need to look around and see what we have available. And actually, if we specifically focus on the um, lactic acid bacteria that are very important by the point of view of the transformation and the fermentation in these systems, we can see that there is already a huge, huge diversity that can be exploited. So in this paper that we have published at the beginning of this, of, of last year, actually, 
you can see that there is a humongous number of different species that can be um, isolated from some fermented products of uh, plant origin. Uh, obviously, this picture is not uh, is not uh, comprehensive because it's not including all the different types of, of fermented foods. But let's say that those are the ones where lactic acid bacteria they are having the major role. For instance, here you don't have uh, you don't have the the the, the, the koji, for instance, or so you don't have soya, the right product, because there there is first an important activity on the on filamentous fungi and then lactic acid bacteria are coming later. So here somehow you can see uh, the, the, the products where lactic acid bacteria, that they, they can really play a major role in the elaboration of the food. And if we summarize all the results that we can collect from the available literature, you can see that there are some species that really are very often, often found like pentosus and plantarum, but also coriniformis and sake. And it is nice if we put it in the, in the hemisphere and we see uh, how the difference of the different products um, uh, comes out from the ecology of lactic acid bacteria, you can see that again, um, you have products that have a different level of diversity. This diversity is also related to uh, geographical distribution. But what I want to what, what I want to underline somehow is the fact that there are um, just few cases where one single lactic acid bacteria is actually the responsible for the fermentation. So again, we need to start to rationalize in terms of communities because um, most of the times there is not only one lactic acid bacteria, but there are more lactic acid bacteria. And let me just finish um, my presentation with um, a kind of, let's say, um, insight on how omics can help us to comprehend food fermentation. Uh, here, I'm going to show you one example that we have uh, published uh, uh, last year on fermented sausages. I mean, is is a little bit, uh, it may seem, uh, let's say, out of topic, but I don't want to focus on the on the matrix or on the product itself, but I just want to give you some examples on how the application of omics and specifically metagenomics combined with metabolomics can really help us to understand what is happening during the fermentation and how we can then exploit the information in order to drive or in order to guide uh, the fermentation process. Uh, three processes, all spontaneous, you can see that uh, there is a difference in the um, ecology of the products uh, based on metagenomics. Uh, there is one species that is the uh, Latilactobacillus sacchi that is for sure more responsible, but you have also, for instance, uh, uh, Lactobacillus, la, la, sorry, Lactobacillus is the, 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 old, the old name, the Latilactobacillus curvatus, but you have also Pediococcus pentosaceus that sometimes is very present, some other times is less present. So already like a very nice interpretation of the ecology, but even more, we can dig down into the function because uh, here you can see that um, we have compared the presence of specific genes uh, in the three uh, main species that we have found. So the Latilatobacillus sacchi, Latilatobacillus pulvatus, and Pediococcus pentosaceus. And you can see that there are some species that they contain a high abundance of specific genes, other ones that do not contain. So somehow they can, uh, let's say, complement each other towards the production of the, of the fermented food, in this case, the fermented sausage. But even um, more fascinating by my point of view is that if we go into the genome reconstruction, you can see that Latilatobacillus sake, because this picture is referred to Latilatobacillus sake, was actually different based on the period when we perform the fermentation. So strains that have been reconstructed from the libraries in February, in March, and in May 
actually showed some differences. So the diversity that we were describing before at the, um, at the consortium level, but also at the group level, should be also um, reflected at the species level and at the strain level. And so this is something important that we need to understand. Again, it is interesting to compare what we find in our metagenomic libraries and also what we find in, in, the, metabo in the metabolome. Uh, you can see here that we were able to reconstruct several pathways, specifically those that uh, went into ethyl um, um, ethanol or uh, ethyls, like um, specific products that may have an impact on the, on the, on the um, sensory properties of the product. And you can see also how there is a real difference in the production. So ethyl acetate and ethanol or ethyl, ethyl alcohol, sorry, was much higher in February when we had specific strains of lactobacillus, latilactobacillus plant, um, sake, sorry, but also some other products that are not very useful like ethyl propanoate or propanoic acid were very highly present when we had the fermentation in March where latilactobacillus pulvatus was present. And those interactions can be really pictured in networks that we can construct where we have positive interactions in blue and negative interactions in red, where we can really visualize how the community is interacting and how the community is responsible for the production of specific compounds. And let me just finish with one last uh, comment and one last sensation that uh, I want, to, um, I want to, to, to transmit, or in any case, I want to uh, deliver to you that you are listening. Um, fermentations have acquired a high level of attention. And this high level of attention comes from the potentials that they have. There was a paper that was published uh, uh, some years ago in, uh, in Nature Microbiology, where there was actually a chef that was describing the opportunities that fermentation could give to enhance flavors, to produce new flavors, and to characterize the foods. However, we do not have to forget that Safety is the prerequisites of foods. So when we are talking about fermentations, we need really to be careful about the fact that safety must be uh, respected. And especially when we do it at domestic level in our kitchen, so we do it in the kitchen of the restaurants, we need to make sure that those um, processes somehow are, uh, are guided, are controlled because football pathogens are always behind the corner and so we need to have we need to have special attention and we need to avoid um, outbreaks i'm finishing also because i have one minute left just a few conclusions uh, sustainable processes i don't think that i have to convince anyone about the sustainability of the fermentation because of the low inputs and little or no waste they can be exploited for the improvement of the taste, the digestibility and nutritional values of the final product. And there is an opportunity nowadays to really exploit fermentation on non-conventional raw materials. As I said before, we are exploiting a very low percentage of the, 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 the plants in our planet, but we need to uh, really understand how the consortia are interacting and molecular methods can help us on that aspect. Mm -hmm. And just finishing again, safety is not an option. So when we do new processes, we go for new products, we always have to be sure that safety is respected. And with that, I'm thank you very much. And I'm more than available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Luca. Um, I have here just two questions from our audience. So the first one is, um, would you have some ideas of newly developed fermented foods inspired from traditional practices and traditional fermented foods? So um, I think that um, the innovation um, coming in the field of fermented foods is more related to the exploitation of new 
raw materials that we have never been considered as suitable for fermentation. So um, fermented foods have, have, let's say, they are very well rooted in the necessity to improve safety, uh, preservation of certain raw materials, traditionally milk and meat. Um, but we have also a lot of other possibilities. So for instance, I'm thinking about uh, dry fruits that have never been considered for, for fermentation, for instance, or combination of traditional fermented foods with new products that are coming or that they are pushed by the transition. So um, what about mixing, for instance, proteins that are coming from, from milk or the milk itself with proteins that are coming from other sources in order to create hybrid fermented foods that are, are you know, like maybe 30% milk, 70% plant origin or things like that. So those, I think that probably are the, 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 the dimensions that we need to, to exploit. Right, thank you. Thank you, Professor Luca. I have just another question. That is, um, do you believe in fermented functional foods? Wow, uh, so, so it depends, it depends about the, the, the I mean, uh, everything relates to the definition of functional, right? <laughs> so because uh, to me, fermented foods are already functional or are implicitly functional in a sense that, you know, they, they have a lot of different characteristics. Just, just think about the bioactive peptides that can be liberated from, you know, proteins. And this is very strong, of course, in the, in the, in the, in the field of dairy products, for instance. But we do not have the right knowledge when we're talking about the different matrices, because it may be that also from plant uh, origin we can have, and especially those that are rich in, in proteins, we can have the liberation of uh, uh, bioactive peptides that can help us somehow. Let's think also about the new um, source of proteins. I mean, I'm thinking about algae, I'm thinking about insects. I mean, we are just now in the phase where we start to talk about it. Probably it is good if we have already some kind of ideas about applying fermentation on those, on those raw materials, on those innovative raw materials in order to get even more functionalities out of it. So for sure, uh, I would say that fermented foods are functional at the end. Of course. So thank you. I think we have no more um, questions, Professor Luca. Thank you very much for your so interesting. Thank you. Plenary speech, and uh, now I will pass the word to my colleagues, Jose and Angela, that will present <coughs> the, the, the oral communications from this first topic. And thank you all. Have a nice day. Uh, good morning. We will now begin a session of four oral communications on alternative protein rich fermented foods. I, I remind speakers that they have 13 minutes for the presentation, followed by two minutes for questions. All the audience who, we are, who are following us on YouTube can post their comments and questions in the chat, and then we will ask the questions to the speakers. And our first speaker is Sophie Landu Liotto, and she will present her work entitled How Fermentation Can Improve the Acceptability of New Pea Protein-Based Foods. Sufi, are you ready? You can share your screen. Yes. And you can start the presentation, please. Yes. It's okay? Uh, yes. Perfect. Uh, sorry. Yes. Well, <laughs> thanks for the introduction. Uh, so today, my presentation will focus on the title you just uh, uh, said, and uh, uh, through project realized in my uh, research unit, uh, Seafood. So uh, we all know that uh, Western style food system are not more sustainable. And for example, in this recent paper, which tried to define an ideal daily diet for men and the planet, uh, they show, if we focus on Western, uh, the actual Western diet, the need to increase 
the share of uh, plant protein while decreasing the share of animal ones. So now, uh, how will uh, scientific research can, um, can contribute to the development of uh, this diet transition? One option, and uh, it, is, uh, it was uh, well presented by Professor Coccola, is to study how uh, microbial processes can contribute to more uh, sustainable products uh, that are using uh, plant-based protein. Well, we know that fermentation have a lot of benefits, including sensorial one, and today I will uh, focus my presentation on this aspect. Well, why? Because fermentation uh, generates uh, very tasty products, and we all know that the pleasure of eating is a really very uh, powerful lever that should be taken into account if we want a real transition. I mean, a quite rapid and massive one. But when I say the foods we love, what are they? Well, in fact, there are the food we are used to in our childhood or uh, either in our culture. So developing new foods, uh, fermented food in our case with a uh, high uh, content in, in a pulse protein is really a very big challenge. If we have a look in traditional fermented food, the fermentation is realized by the endogenous microbial community uh, that is very well adapted to the matrix. And so uh, man uh, has uh, selected them through practices and also by rational approach to develop control fermented food. So for example, now, we are, we are producing uh, dairy products using, for example, lactic bacteria isolated at the beginning from raw milk, and we use them for the acidifying uh, um, activities uh, that realized uh, the sanitary quality, but also, of course, nutritional and uh, sensory qualities. Now, if we have a look to traditional fermented food based on pulses that are the main uh, plant uh, rich in protein, uh, we, have, we should have a look on Asia and Africa because these products are really developed there. And in fact, in this product, in the raw materials, the endogenous microbial community are very specific. As an example, if we have a look to natto, which is a soybean uh, fermented products, there is different species of bacillus that realize the fermentation through the strong protein proteolytic activity and the final high pH uh, realized the, or sure, the sanitary quality, but also this uh, endogenous uh, flora uh, generate organoleptic quality very, very specific. And unfortunately, they are not poorly adapted to the taste of Western consumer. So uh, in fact, it is difficult um, uh, to find, find, we should <laughs> therefore uh, find another way than using endogenous flora to develop new products for the actual Western consumer. So to avoid the development of endogenous microbial community in pulses, including the bacilli that are highly thermoresistant, we can't apply usual thermal processes as in milk. Consequently, many products uh, based on pulses developed for Western consumer are yogurt type uh, because we are used to and because the pH, the low pH coupled with moderate thermal processes assure the absence of germination of the endogenous flora and especially bacilli one. And now if we analyzed the scientific literatures, there are many studies on the use of lactic acid bacteria to ferment and to improve different sources of pulses in different form. I mean, flour, concentrate, isolate. But however, many of them um, are realized with very simple culture. And so the richness of the potential of microbial interaction are underexploited. Moreover, P, one of the more interesting pulses, is little exploited because of its very major organoleptic defects. I mean, um, bini notes and uh, bitterness and astringence. 
That's why, because we love a challenge, in my research unit, Safe Food, uh, we, uh, where our team is specialized in cheese ripening microbial community, we have developed different projects on pea protein fermentation. And now I will illustrate through uh, two approaches. The first one was carried out during a PhD with a private company. And uh, we will, we, we, uh, the, the scope was to develop a yogurt-like product, so uh, not very innovative in type of products, but using a co-culture of lactic bacteria to have uh, the low pH, but also other microbial uh, microorganism and to uh, improve the sensual quality. Our goal for, was also to develop a commercial product. So yeasts that are used in, um, in food fermentations are known uh, to be a low sensitive to pH, though they are capable to grow with, uh, in co-culture with lactic bacteria. Moreover, some of them have enzymatic activities such as alcohol dehydrogenase that can reduce, uh, for example, hexanal, which is one of the major cause of green note. Moreover, a lot of uh, yeasts produce fruity notes that are very compatible with the uh, yogurt-like yogurt products. So, uh, based on our scientific background on cheese ripening yeasts, we focused on various species used in this context, as well as some non-saccharomyces uh, yeasts used in analogy. So finally, three uh, species were selected, one Cluvermyces martianus, one Cluvermyces lactis, and one Torula spora delbureki, uh, that when uh, cultivated, co-cultivated in a 10-person pea protein matrix with a lactic uh, starter, did not significantly disturb the acidifying activity of the starter. So the pH can be reached uh, with a time uh, acceptable. And now uh, this uh, co-culture generate products uh, evaluated by a trend panel are uh, less uh, green than the control and uh, with pleasant notes, uh, thanks to fruity notes. Now, analysis of volatile compounds by gas chromatography mass spectrometry have shown the elimination of the major green notes, hexanal, but other molecules described in the literatures as being able to participate to the bini perception have either decreased or increased. So it's, it was complex to, to say that the off flavor was really decreased. Nevertheless, uh, a significant presence in quantity and quality of fruity esters demonstrates the ability of these yeasts to, at the very least, mask the defects. So this approach is therefore an effective means of natural aromatization of uh, pulses-based fermented food, and the GMI in rye uh, patent has been filled in a dry ingredient. Now, the second approach, a uh, more exploratory one, was to demonstrate that our knowledge on dairy microbial ecosystem uh, could be uh, useful, uh, mobilized to develop products with, uh, based on pea proteins to improve sensory quality. The objective was also uh, to find microbial community capable to compete with endogenous microorganisms in mixed matrix, uh, milk, pea protein, or, or each separately, but with or without acidification. We were also looking for new perceptions, unexpected aroma that could lead to more innovative products. Those <clears throat> from uh, 55 strains from our collection from animal and vegetal, vegetal origins, belonging to three groups with a complementary metabolic activity, we carry out a, draw, um, a random draw from each subgroup and repeat it 10 times. So uh, 320 cultures were realized with increasing complexity on a 1%, uh, sorry, 100% uh, pea protein, 100% milk or 50-50. And we follow 
sensory description, the growth of the microorganism, and also the effect, uh, the barrier effects uh, using metabarcoding. Metabar so here, here, sorry. So based on this, we select 10 microbial consortia with sensory and ecological characteristics. Uh, I will present then the, only the sensory analysis. So uh, check all that apply approach was carried out and represented here by a factorial correspondence analysis. You have in, uh, in red the descriptor and in blue uh, the consortia. And some consortia differ well from the control uh, and this thanks to pleasant perception, cheers, perception that can be expected, but also fruity one and an even more unexpected and interesting chocolate and roasted perception. So combining these results and the barrier effect, three consortia were selected and studied in gel matrix. And finally, uh, we have selected only one to uh, realize and to assess the acceptability uh, by consumer. So we carry out a large scale production uh, in the experimental old in the mixed research unit in Aurillac to conduct consumer studies. Well, the result will be part of the presentation of my colleague Anne saint and I hope you are eagerly awaiting them. So as a conclusion, I hope my presentation has shown how the study of the functioning of food microbial communities can provide solution to, um, to that are both realistic and very innovative. Of course, we need to continue to build on the results and currently we are involved, our unit is involved in projects linked to food transition project whose major characteristics is the interdisciplinarity, which is essential in such complex subjects. And uh, as a more general uh, conclusion, I want also to say that acceptability includes other aspects than hedonic one, of course, such as nutritional and environmental. Moreover, we are now in an increasingly multicultural world and we can open that uh, the new generations will change their diet habits more easily. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks for all the people that contribute to, see, to this work, of course. And uh, thanks for the question. And sorry if uh, I was too thank, long. <laughs> thank you, Sophie, for your very interesting presentation. We have a question from the audience. Uh, do you think that fun fungi are actors of interest for the fermentation of legumes? What about the bitterness issue of legumes? And do you think that fermentation could be an option? Yes, sure. First of all, concerning molds, yes, of course, they, have, uh, they could be used because it depends why, what we want. But if we want to develop uh, products that could be eaten now by, by people was for rapid uh, transition, we know that in a lot of fermented food, we have molds. Uh, in a lot of, uh, of cheese, for example, on other products. So that, I'm sure that the molds are also very interesting to be studied. And uh, the other point was concerning bitterness. Uh, well, bitterness is mainly due, uh, due to uh, phenolic compounds, saponin in the in pulse uh, products. And the other issue that during fermentation, the proteolytic activity will give, uh, give rise to uh, peptides that could be also bitter. So we try to, um, uh, to study uh, how fermentation can perhaps produce some, uh, some uh, bitter peptide, but how also they can degrade them. But concerning the phenolic compounds, uh, we are not studying them, but I'm sure that there is also possibility to, uh, to degrade them or, for, or to mask them. Uh, thank you, Sophie, and congratulations for your work. Uh, we will move on now. <clears throat> so we will um, let's move on to the second oral communication that will be given by Christelle Ambro. She will talk about the role of lactic acid bacteria on the nutritional quality of cereal-based fermented foods. Christelle, 
you can share your presentation. Do you see the presentation? I don't see anything yet. No. No, you need to, to share your, your screen. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Yes, it's so, okay. So yes, the screen is yours, you can start. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you uh, very much for the invitation uh, to present some of the work we did on the role of bacteria on the nutritional quality of cereal-based fermented food. So uh, me, I will bring an African touch to the, to the, the speech we have uh, today. So, um, so first, um, as I, I usually work in Africa, uh, we have population that are eating a lot of vegetable-based uh, foods and uh, not a lot of, uh, of um, uh, animal products. And uh, there is a change in the dietary habits in Europe uh, for health, ethical, or environmental reasons. And uh, there is an increasing number of people with uh, vegans, vegetarians, or flexitarians diet. And uh, every Everywhere in the world, the traditional diet is based mainly on plain foods, especially cereals, and uh, depending on the places, more or less legumes. And in many places, there is a poor consumption in uh, animal products. And cereals can contribute significantly to the coverage of many uh, nutrients and micronutrients, uh, such as uh, vitamins and minerals. And uh, especially when consumed as whole grain, uh, they can really uh, contribute to the, the nutritional requirement, but some specific population are at risk of micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Luca, this morning, the, there is an improvement of the nutritional quality of the raw material after fermentation. And uh, just to mention a few for the protein, there is an increase of the digestibility. There can be a synthesis of amino acids. Uh, so as uh, bacteria can also hydrolyze starch and fibers, uh, but they can produce, synthesize during the fermentation, some vitamins, especially the B vitamins. And uh, also uh, through the acidification and some uh, enzymatic activities, uh, bacteria can improve the bioaccessibility of minerals. The lactic acid bacteria from traditional cereal-based fermented food uh, are very interesting because the adaptation of these bacteria is niche specific and the traditional fermented foods can be a source of microorganisms with original characteristics. And uh, in the lab, we are trying to make use of this biodiversity uh, by using an integrated approach based on the relationship between the fermented food microbiota and the nutrition. So I will focus my, uh, my talk on the case of vitamin B12. Um, so vitamin B12 is among the eight water-soluble B vitamins. It is involved in really uh, important processes such as DNA synthesis, amino acid, and fatty acid metabolism. It is not at all synthesized by plants or animals, so this is really, really important. And it's built up in animal tissues via microbial interaction. And so the only uh, vitamin B12 uh, dietary sources are animal products. So uh, deficiency can occur, especially uh, with pe for people who has a vegan diet and with a poor dietary diversification. And deficiencies uh, can lead to different health problems such as anemia and neuropathy. Uh, fermentation can improve the vitamin B12 content of the raw material, but the bacteria from cereal fermentation can either produce or consume B vitamins. And this has been shown uh, repetitively by different uh, authors, uh, where uh, two uh, bacterial species, Propionibacterium freudenreichi and Lactobacillus reuteri, have been shown to be able to synthesize vitamin B12 in the fermentation. Nevertheless, the microbially uh, produced uh, vitamin B12 can be an active form used by humans or inactive in humans. So uh, here I present an original work we did in Ethiopia. Uh, this is a case study of injera. 
So injera is a traditional flat bread, such as a kind of pancake that is consumed daily by Ethiopia, by, in Ethiopia, by Ethiopian people. It is prepared from teff, a very, very small cereal, and the fermentation to produce this, uh, this food is not controlled, and it is either spontaneous, just by adding water on the, the teff flour, or by backsloping. And uh, this work was really a bet because um, we know that TEF shouldn't contain any vitamin B12, but we were hoping, uh, based on other work on other vitamin B, that uh, fermentation maybe could, uh, uh, there could be a production of B12 during the fermentation. Uh, so uh, we collected samples in Addis Abeba in 10 households, and we took the teff flour, the fermented paste, and the injera to check the effect of fermentation and cooking. What we saw was really interesting because here you see the vitamin B12 content in the three different sample types. And we saw that there is vitamin B12 in the teff flour. So we were very surprised by this, um, this result because as I mentioned, the vegetables are not able at all to synthesize uh, vitamin B12. After fermentation, there is a huge increase in the vitamin B12 content that is slightly affected by cooking. What is important to keep in mind is the teff flour is far from being sterile. So here uh, we are really working with people who are uh, producing the teff a traditional way. So it is through uh, the threshing is done by oaks and the teff is eaten as whole grain. So the microbial uh, charge of the teff flour is really important. So we tried to a little bit characterize this uh, microbiota by real-time PCR, uh, and we focused on um, some bacteria that are traditionally, traditionally associated with uh, cereal fermentation, such as Lactobacillus plantarum, Lactobacillus fermentum, and the Wesela genus. And we added the two uh, species known for the vitamin B12 production. So what we saw is uh, in all the samples, almost all the samples, we were able to see the traditional actors of fermentation, especially Lactobacillus plantarum and Lactobacillus and Wesela. And in almost all samples also, we were able to detect uh, at certain concentration Propionibacterium fredenreici. Uh, this bacteria is more known in the cheese uh, fermentation, but it's also found in the soil. But we didn't find at all uh, any member of the Lactobacillus reuteri species. Uh, we calculated what could be the contribution of injera consumption to vitamin B12 requirement. So uh, we took the nutritional requirement for children and adults, and we estimated the injera consumption per, in gram per day. And we calculated that the, um, the regular consumption of injera uh, can keep contribute to either 0% of the nutritional requirement, because after fermentation, sometimes there is uh, even the initial B12 is consumed. But after fermentation, it can also reach uh, really high levels and a regular consumption of injera can contribute to up to 158% of the nutritional requirements. But as you saw from the uh, samples collected in, the, um, in Addis Abeba, that there is an important variation since the fermentation is not controlled. And also I mentioned that two forms uh, can be synthesized from the microbes. And uh, we tried to characterize by UPLC the form of vitamin B12. And we were not really happy because uh, in the uh, cereal fermentation, we had only the inactive B12. But uh, this was an opportunity for us to, to see if by using a, a vitamin B12 producer uh, that was able to synthesize the active form, if it was possible or not to increase the vitamin B12 uh, content of the injera. So this is what we did. So first we inoculated uh, the pure strains and then we did the backsloping. So 10 backsloping starting from this first inoculation uh, because this is what is done traditionally uh, in the household to prepare injera. And uh, we measured uh, the B12 in the TEF. So 
as we saw before, there is a, a small amount of B12 present in the death from Ethiopia. And after fermentation, we see that we have an increase after the inoculation of the pure bacteria. And with the backsloping, this increase is not uh, regular. So just to remind you that this step flower is not sterile at all. So the bacteria we add has to compete uh, with the endogenous microbiota. And after cooking, the vitamin B12 is not uh, really decreasing. Uh, another example is uh, based on the study on uh, folate, uh, so vitamin B9, that is also really important for health. And uh, we did a similar work just before. And just to, to mention that uh, here we have the, um, the traditional injera. Uh, here we have a strain we isolated from injera, able to produce vitamin B12. And we have this backsloping. Um, a third round of backsloping. And as a positive control, we also used Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that is a very known um, uh, folate producer, and the combination of the yeast and the bacteria. And what we saw is uh, that uh, the folate content of traditional injera is not bad, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae can increase this, uh, this concentration a lot. And all the... Um, uh, the samples with the use of the pure strain producing folate uh, can increase the folate content of the injera, again, in non-sterile conditions. We calculated the contribution to the, to the nutritional requirement in kids and women, and uh, we saw that uh, we doubled the amount of, uh, of um, folate uh, after inoculation with the bacteria. Uh, and uh, we have also a, a better effect with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but what is more important is that the use of the strain was uh, producing an injera that was preferred by the consumer, even by comparison with the traditional injera. Uh, so it is really, really important when we work on selection of bacteria to check this organoleptic uh, quality and acceptability to ensure that any um, change we can propose to the producer will be accepted. So uh, finally, uh, what are we doing now? Um, based on the success, especially on the, the folate uh, production during fermentation, we are trying now to produce the bacteria in Ethiopia. That is not easy because it's really a country where with a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, problems in terms of uh, buying abroad, uh, setting up as uh, installation in the laboratories. Uh, but for this one, we have the support of UNICEF that was very, very interesting interested by our results on folate. And we are actually trying to estimate the feasibility of using the active strains in traditional production units or in households. Uh, we will also measure the efficacy of the consumption of improved injera at population level. And we have a lot of contact uh, with different uh, actors uh, to widespread the use of the active strain. And at the same time, uh, we want to make use of uh, this uh, knowledge uh, we took from a traditional fermented food to develop novel food. And uh, we are actually working with uh, a society uh, to try to develop a cereal based fermented product with high vitamin B content. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Christelle, for your very nice presentation. We have a question from the audience. Um, and uh, I would like to ask if these novel foods that you are develop, uh, no, sorry, uh, which vegetable spe species could be targeted to fulfill nutritional needs? And do you think that pseudo cereals could be of interest in a nutritional point of view? Uh, yes, of course. Um, what we do uh, is we combine, because we have also results in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, where we combined uh, the fermentation of cereals and legumes, uh, because we know that cereals only are not enough to fulfill the nutritional requirements. Uh, so uh, with the industrial partner, we are combining cereals and uh, legumes. And uh, as we want to stay in a um, sustainable uh, uh, role, uh, we use local uh, producers. Uh, 
So we use traditional uh, cereals uh, in France, such as uh, buckwheat, uh, chickpeas, things like that. But the work is just starting. Okay, I, I have um, I have uh, also a question. I would like to ask you if these novel foods that you are developing are well accepted in general by the consumer. Uh, yes, we did some uh, some attempt. Uh, like uh, we started two years ago with some uh, students from engineer schools, and uh, so the idea is to produce a kind of uh, beverage or yogurt-like product, and they were able to produce. I was really uh, enthusiastic, something very very nice. So uh, I had uh, them at home uh, for for a while, and I was preparing myself, you know, by back sloping for a while, and um, so of course they were working on the texture, on the aroma, uh, with the strain and different raw materials and uh, this is why we started uh, the collaboration with the enterprise but it was I would say more like um, a little bit um, uh, there, there is this lactic, lactic acid production so it's fresh and uh, also they were putting some coffee flavor or lemon so it was really really nice but we did I would say uh, an organoleptic test but uh, only in the lab at local level but uh, it was well accepted. Okay, thank you again, Christelle, and congratulations for your work. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, now I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Angela Fernandes, who will continue moderating this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jose. Good morning, uh, everyone. We, we will continue with our participant session. I remind all participants who follow us on the YouTube channel that they will be able to leave their questions in the chat during the session. So let's move on. And Fanny Cannon will start her presentation entitled Positive Interactions Between Lactic Acid Bacteria and Must Have to Develop New Fermented Foods. Fanny, are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready, but I'm not really uh, Fanny Cannon because she she was not able to present today. So uh, I replace okay. her. So my okay. name is Valérie Gagnier. I was uh, the supervisor of Fanny and uh, I will present. Uh, I thank you, the organizer, to uh, give me the opportunity to present part of her work. Okay, Valérie. Dedicated to the positive interaction between lactic acid bacteria. So okay. do you see my presentation? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. You can start. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, the, the view on our, our food habits is changing. Uh, actually, uh, food is responsible for one third of, uh, uh, sorry, I, um, uh, uh, I tried to, um, okay, because I, I, I have some to have, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, yes, okay. So, because I see my, I, I see your, uh, I, I cannot see the entirely my screen. So, it's okay. Okay. So, I start again. Sorry. So, uh, actually, the food is responsible for one third of the greenhouse gas emission worldwide. Therefore, there is a necessity to decrease the proportion of animal based food, notably proteins, in the diet. And uh, as we can see, the dairy products is compatible with emerging vegetarian and flexitarian diets in combination with plant products. And we can use it for a better enhancements of uh, food transition. So uh, when we look at uh, the 100% based plant-based yogurt, it can help food transition. And actually it, uh, uh, on the French market, you can have a different type of plant-based yogurt that are made of soy milk, almond milk and coconut milk. And compared to the dairy yogurt, some issues of plant-based yogurt are related first to the nutritional value, to sensory profile and digestion. Regarding the nutritional value, uh, we have also uh, we have a lower content in proteins, vitamin and calcium compared with milk, and we have a higher energy uh, in uh, uh, higher energy, and we can have also anti-nutritional compound like fat, uh, phytic acid. We can also evoke uh, for the sensory profiles. Uh, the presence of, uh, of, of exanas that is a component implied uh, in the green uh, flavor. And we also can have a depreciated texture 
uh, compared to milk. And regarding digestion, digestion, we can have also, we can evoke also the presence of uh, a galacto oligosaccharides that can imply intestinal discomfort. Therefore, in order to uh, overcome these issues, we can uh, associate plant with milk. And uh, in, the, in that case, we can restore the content in protein, vitamins, and calcium. We can also reduce the total energy and we can uh, improve the texture profiles. And regarding the other part, we can also uh, add a fermentation to improve the, uh, the, the, to decrease the phytic acid, the hexanal, and the ghost. And we can uh, have the possibility to, insert, to easily insert the plant fraction in the yogurt process. Here is the, the, the general scheme of the yogurt and the fermented milk production. So we start uh, classically with milk that we can skim and standardize, and we can enrich in uh, milk powder or concentrates. We can eat treated the milk and uh, prior to add the starters to pour into the pot to ferment and to store. And in order to uh, produce uh, mixed uh, dairy and uh, legume um, yogurt fermentation, you, we can replace the milk powder or concentrate by flour or protein isolates of legumes. And secondly, we can change the, lact uh, we can use in that case lupin uh, is, uh, in our study. And in the second, we can use uh, different lactic acid bacteria that are responsible for specific properties of yogurt. In that sense, the objective is to add the functionalities of the lactic acid bacteria in fermented mixed plants and dairy plant-based yogurt. Classically, uh, the bacteria in the milk are able to uh, hydrolyze the proteins of milk, the lactose, and to produce aroma compounds, organic acid, as well as exopolysaccharide production. Uh, in the case of uh, a plant-based yogurt, we need uh, to have uh, over uh, properties. That means that we need to decrease hexanal, uh, to, to decrease the hexanal, to decrease also phytic acid, to hydrolyze lupin protein, and to be able to hydrolyze the galacto oligosaccharides. As uh, you know, that a super, such a super strain does not exist. So we had to associate specific strains to, uh, to be able to, uh, to um, have all the functionality present. So we choose to have, the, to have an, an approach that use positive interaction between strains and we base this on uh, their nitrogen metabolisms. We show in a previous um, study that uh, uh, the strains that are is proteolytic is able to, to furnish peptides and amino acids to sustain growth of a non-proteolytic strains that have specific properties to help uh, the functionality of the dairy-based and plant-based yogurt. So we choose the different, the, we uh, put another, uh, we, ah, sorry. So we make the different experimental design for mixed lupin yogurt manufacture, and we use three factors. First, the starter culture. We used uh, either monoculture of uh, three strains that have different proteolytic capability, one with a very high proteolytic activity, a medium one, and a non-proteolytic activity with plantara. And we use co-culture between uh, the proteolytic one and the non-proteolytic one. We use also two types of fat, so the milk fat, to, uh, uh, in a, like in a classical um, um, yogurt, and the coconut oil to uh, increase the vegetable part. And we use also two milk lupin protein ratio. Uh, we start with 6.6% uh, 6 .6 total proteins, and we used uh, either 50% of milk or 67% of milk. We uh, look at different responses regarding the bacterial growth, acidification, proteolysis, and the, the production of various uh, metabolites. We also uh, look at uh, physical proper, various physical properties, 
and we uh, made some sensory analysis on one type of sugars. So regarding the growth uh, of the starter culture in the milk lupin yogurt, uh, we can see that uh, depending on the different uh, co-culture and, and monoculture and co-culture, we can uh, 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 reach a pH comp uh, comprised between 4.7 to 4.9 in a time reach reaching 7 to 12 hour and the total starter count is over a 10 to the 9 uh, colony forming unit per gram of yogurt in each time. Regarding the proteolysis, the product, uh, we show here the production and consumption of peptides and amino acids that was uh, calculated uh, by the, the value after fermentation minus the control value and we saw that the only the F uh, starter was able to produce high amounts of um, peptides and amino acid. And this was a great part that it was favoring uh, the, the, pro the, the growth of uh, the non-proteolytic strains that are a very high uh, population uh, at the final step, and uh, that uh, is able that the the F is able to have positive interaction. So, the, in order to uh, to sum up the impact of the co-culture, I will show you a principal component anal analysis that reports the proteolysis. The physical property, that means the viscosity, firmness, exotropy, and water holding capacities, as well as the production of main uh, organic acids, as well as the uh, acidification parameters and the volatile compounds that were identified. Regarding uh, the F uh, starter, it was associated mainly with the high proteolytic uh, activity with a higher pH and a high ten content in hexanal and a lower firmness and a high water, capac water holding capacity. It was completely the opposite for the, uh, the over starter that has a lower uh, proteolysis, a uh, lower pH and higher firmness. And finally, for the non-proteolytic starters, uh, it was able to produce large amounts of uh, uh, volatile compounds that are very interesting for flavor and also uh, um, uh, interesting also organic acid. When we look at the different co-culture, we can see that there was a great uh, influence of the, the two, uh, the, the co-culture and they, uh, they are increased in the different uh, uh, physical properties as well are organic and a decrease in hexanal and it was uh, the, the, the co-culture was located between the two monoculture but in contrast to uh, the co-culture of LNP that there was no effect on the co-culture in this case uh, that is translated by the way that there are no interaction between the population between LNP in this case. Regarding the sensory analysis, we can see here the correspondence analysis uh, of the, the different uh, uh, individuals. And we can see that we can have uh, differentiation uh, mainly uh, on the milk lupin protein ratios on the first axis. And we can have a, a great difference between the ratio 50, where the lupin was in more uh, concentration and uh, we have a more un un unpleasant, bitter and strong uh, texture. And we have also in contrast to the ratio 77 that was considered as more pleasure with texture and non-homogeneous. Regarding the second axis, it was differentiated uh, according to the fat type. And we can see that uh, we have um, the milk fat that was uh, uh, felt as milky, lacty, and goaty, and that the cocoa was uh, considered as fruity, fresh, and nutty. As a conclusion, we can see that uh, regarding the different parameters for the milk plant protein ratio, we can consider that less than 30% of the plant protein was very appreciated by the past nihilist, and uh, there was also higher firmness. 
Regarding the fat type, we can see that the uh, cocoa was associated with lower firmness and was sensorially detected and can be a way to uh, uh, increase the appreciation of uh, the mixed uh, uh, products. And regarding the starter culture, there was a great impact on pH and proteolysis that occurred after the fermentation and hence it uh, gives some uh, consequences on physical properties, notably on the water holding capacity and uh, the firmness. And we can show also that there were more functionalities that were expressed in yogurt when there are interaction between strains. That means as was, it was observed between the cockleshell between F and P in which the proteolytic strains F stimulated the non proteolytic strain P. In this case, we show that we can have higher firmness and viscosity, higher diversity of organic acids and volatile compounds. And we have also higher decrease in hexanal that uh, is responsible for partly the, the green flavor. And finally, we can uh, say that uh, the mixed dairy plant-based yogurt is a good start for the diet transition as it softly gets consumers acquainted with the unfamiliar properties of plant-based yogurt. So for, uh, I thank you for your attention. If you want to have more information on all the works of Fanny, you can have the free uh, uh, papers that are publishing from 2020 for, to 2022. I thank you for your attention and uh, is, uh, I'm ready for answer your question. Thank you, Valerie, for your interesting uh, work and presentations. Congratulations. Uh, we have one question from the audience. Uh, Valerie, do you think that the approach you developed on Lupin could be applied to other legume-based matrices? I think that the yogurt process is a, is a really good way to, uh, to, be, uh, to uh, include various parts of, uh, of plant proteins. Uh, because you can use either concentrate or you can powder, or you can use powder, flour, or isolate in uh, to replace the, the, the parts that of milk uh, that can uh, that is used to enrich the product as usual. So it can, it can be an easy an easy way uh, to introduce uh, legumes, and uh, the fact is that uh, we have to adapt the the lactic acid bacteria. Uh, uh, to be sure that uh, we have the, the final function, the final desired function at the end. Okay. Uh, thank you, Valerie, for your uh, presentation. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Uh, we move on to the next presentation, uh, which be given by Anne St. Eve, entitled Sensory and Consumer Insignis for the Room Based Ingredients and Fermented Foods. And are you ready? Yes, I think it's okay. Yes, it is okay. You can uh, start. Can you share, uh, see my presentation? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, it's okay. Yes, it's okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Lilian and Pascal, for your uh, invitation to this uh, webinar. Uh, so I am Anne Santev, I am assistant professor at AgroParisTech in the same research unit, uh, Safe Food, as uh, Pascal Bonard and Sophie Landau. Uh, my presentation will focus on sensory and consumer insight for legume-based uh, ingredients and fermented uh, food. Uh, for that, I illustrate my presentation with different research projects performed uh, in our lab. Uh, so, as largely said this morning, the growing population is demanding new healthy and sustainable solutions for foods and beverages. Uh, to contribute to this uh, food transition, uh, the use of legumes in food would help to develop uh, this new sustainable food offer. And this, the pulses ingredients uh, present many advantages at the agronomic and nutritional levels but also uh, these ingredients present very interesting functional properties with their role in emulsifying or gelling properties as example. Thus, uh, researchers and food companies are focusing on the development of this pulse food offer 
regarding uh, their different benefits, uh, benefits in health, agronomic, and sustainability. In particular, uh, over the last decade, researchers and food industry have been searching for altern alternatives to animal proteins, and the popularity uh, of plant-based diet is growing uh, among the consumers. So by consequence, uh, in recent, uh, recent years, a strong increase in plant-based uh, food products uh, was observed, in particular with soybeans. Uh, but we can observe an emergence of other pulses like peas or fava, uh, fava beans. Uh, the seeds of pulses can be directly consumed uh, by consumers but mainly they are transformed into different types of ingredients uh, like flour, concentrate, or protein isolates. And these ingredients are incorporated in the formulation of uh, processed foods, ranging from uh, dairy substitutes, uh, sport drinks, uh, or baked products, as uh, illustrated uh, in these slides. But the use of uh, these plant ingredients presents also some limits uh, as nutritional with uh, the presence of anti-nutritional factors uh, and also some sensory off notes, in particular bini notes, uh, an aromatic uh, complex aromatic notes, bitterness and astringency, uh, which can limit their use uh, in food products and can decrease the liking by consumers. So uh, one of the main challenges to move, uh, to move towards uh, a sustainable food system is to be in line with consumer expectations and so with their pleasure. So in this context, and in order to optimize uh, the use of pulses ingredients in food products, it is necessary to better understand the origin of their sensory of notes and also of their functional properties in order to identify some levers to optimize their extraction process and their use in the final uh, food uh, formulation. So considering uh, the process of plant ingredients, different extraction ways can be applied to pulse grains, but also, also uh, on ingredients uh, with enzymatic thermal treatment or fermentation which can have a large impact on their properties. So the objective uh, of our work is to try to make uh, ingredients more functional while limiting the development of this uh, sensory of notes. Uh, the challenge is to find the best compromise between functionality and perceptions. Thus, to better, uh, a better knowledge of uh, the composition, the uh, detailed composition and the properties of these ingredients is necessary to better understand the possible masking levers or to optimize uh, the ingredient process uh, in order to minimize the off nut in the final product and to try to optimize the liking by the consumers. I will now illustrate a work uh, performed in the context of an ETN uh, European project in our lab. Uh, it was the PhD of Sidar Charan, who, who focused on the role of process condition on the functionality and volatile aroma composition of fava uh, protein concentrate. The majority of fava bean flavor derives itself from the degradation of lipids, amino acids, carbohydrates, uh, as example, through uh, enzymatic or non-enzymatic reaction. And in this project, we try to identify the major role uh, of the pH uh, in the process uh, uh, to modify the ingredient and to, uh, to understand the role uh, implied on the flavor profile and by consequence on perception. Uh, thus, understanding the chemistry of fava bean flavor uh, and the role of process conditions in relation to sensory perception uh, would help the food industry to make better choices uh, for appropriate process condition to use, as example, and while uh, targeting a specific food application with a particular uh, uh, flavor perception in, uh, in detail. 
In this same project, we interested in non-volatile uh, components, including phenolic uh, compounds or saponin, uh, which play an important role in nutritional, functional, and also uh, sensory properties. So in particular, our taste perception as a bitterness and astringency uh, is directly related to the dissolution of this molecule in the saliva. So we try to understand the role of different ways of producing and modifying uh, fava ingredients uh, on the composition of this non-volatile component. And we confirm the major role of the pH uh, on the composition uh, in non-volatile uh, molecules. So considering this result, huh, food industry could target this limitation and their chemical origin uh, and monitor the changes uh, due to the processing in, uh, in order to develop some ingredients more acceptable uh, for consumers. In another project uh, performed during the PhD work uh, of Audrey Cosson with uh, industrial partners uh, on pea protein isolates, we implemented a multi-criteria approach uh, developed to help uh, to food uh, development challenges. And this approach uh, consists in integrating the multiple functionality of the products as composition, sensory properties, functional properties, to understand, to better understand the determinant of the perception. And for that, we developed an approach uh, by separating pea protein isolates into different fractions uh, correspond, corresponding to soluble and insoluble molecules and molecules with different sizes and properties. And we studied the compositions of this fraction uh, in uh, phytochemicals molecules, volatile molecules, uh, and peptides. Uh, and we relate this data to sensory characteristics uh, of pea protein based uh, solutions. Uh, which were evaluated by a trained panel and a, a profile method. Um, alors, a very large <laughs> number of molecules were identified and quantified in this, uh, in this project, in this uh, isolates. Um, and after that, some partial least square regression, or PLS regressions, uh, by multi-block were performed to establish uh, some sensory predictive models uh, and we try to identify which fractions uh, and which molecules in these fractions are mainly at the origin of uh, bini notes of bitterness and of uh, astringency uh, perceptions. Uh, results showed that very complex mechanism can explain the perception and a lot of interactions between molecules and between perceptions uh, were highlighted, in especially uh, between uh, uh, bitterness and uh, bini, uh, bini perceptions. Uh, so now I would like to present another project introduced uh, by Sophie just uh, before, and which uh, performed on the use of, of uh, food fermentation uh, as an interesting opportunity to introduce legumes uh, in our diets. So this project uh, aimed to demonstrate a concept of formulating fermented food with pea protein, uh, but also to evaluate uh, the environmental impact and the acceptability by consumers uh, linked to the development of such uh, fermented products. Uh, before studying the, the impact of environment and consumer perceptions, uh, we had to change the scale of uh, fabrication. And to do this, uh, we worked with the uh, Inhai cheese platform in Aurillac, and we, some adaptations uh, were necessary to arrive at, at this fin, uh, final uh, technological uh, diagram uh, as illustrated uh, on this slide. And four products uh, were thus uh, produced um, and contained different concentration of peas with milk um, from uh, 25 to 100 percent uh, of peas. And the microbial uh, consortium used uh, was composed of uh, four uh, strains. And as you can see uh, here, uh, the different picture on, uh, of the fermented product uh, was presented uh, in this slide. 
so first, concerning the results, uh, I, I begin with the environmental impact linked to the development of uh, this fermented uh, mixed plant and dairy products. Uh, and the life cycle analysis uh, methods was used. Um, these results were very rich and allowed uh, many conclusions, so I can only describe very partially uh, today uh, these results. Uh, but one of the main results uh, was for the product uh, containing only uh, pea protein, uh, we can conclude that the manufacturing process is more impactful uh, that, than the obtaining uh, of the raw material uh, for 12 indicators on the 16 uh, measures. Indeed, on the preparation of the milk, the milk of, of pea, <laughs> uh, the refining and the cleaning are the most impactful uh, steps for the environment. Then uh, we compared the four fermented plant products on all the measured indicators and uh, results are very different uh, in function of these uh, LCA indicators. For five indicators, uh, we have similar uh, results, uh, whatever the percentage of P uh, in fermented products. So for them, uh, there is no benefit uh, from changing the quality uh, of raw material. But for seven uh, indicators as uh, climate change, uh, increasing the level of pea protein uh, in comparison to milk would improve the environmental impact. So we can conclude uh, that the process of plant-based food uh, is more environmental friendly than the production of milk-based products, but only for some of uh, the measured indicators. In parallel, we studied uh, the impact of pea content in fermented uh, products on consumer uh, perceptions and liking, and how information linked to an environmental or uh, nutritional benefit can impact the consumer behavior. For that, we evaluated the hedonic cost for consumers uh, in regard to nutritional or environmental benefit to modify uh, the type of consumption. Uh, and for that, uh, we studied with uh, 240 consumers who were recruited as cheese consumers. Two approaches were used, sensory and consumer uh, classical methodology and an experimental economics uh, methodology. The consumers uh, were questioned on their liking and purchase intentions uh, for fermented uh, plant products having uh, 25, 50, or 75% of it. Um, indeed, uh, the, the product containing only peas uh, was eliminated because it was too much different from a sensory point of view. Um, then a second step uh, has been carried out in this experiment. Huh? We submitted different information to consumers. Half of the consumer was informed on the environmental benefits linked to the consumption of such products, and the other half uh, of the nutritional benefits. And liking and intention to purchase uh, were evaluated just after. So the results uh, showed large difference in liking uh, between uh, products uh, with a different uh, pea content. The 25% uh, pea product was the more popular as expected, and the 75% uh, of pea uh, in the product was the least appreciated. Uh, and we observed a very strong inter-individual viability uh, between the consumers uh, with the identification of three uh, clear groups of consumers, but I, I don't uh, detail uh, this result here. Uh, in parallel, we showed an increase in the purchasing intention uh, when the peak content decreased, which, uh, which is a, a strong correlation with appreciation. And we observe after information uh, on nutritional benefits, uh, that uh, result showed uh, an increase in purchasing intention for products with uh, 25 and 50% of peas. 
Uh, after information on the environmental benefits, an increase in purchase uh, intentions was observed, but only for the product with uh, 50% of these. And uh, concerning uh, the product with uh, the 70% of these, uh, there is no effect of product information uh, on a purchase uh, intention. So in conclusion, we, we can uh, conclude that this study contributes to show the limited consumer acceptability of fermented innovation, mixing animal and plant protein sources. And we show that uh, dietary changes are possible, but it exists a real cost for consumer to uh, implement it. Uh, in conclusion to this presentation, uh, to go towards uh, a food transition, it is necessary to implement multi-criteria approach to lead to design healthier and more sustainable plant-based products. And of course, and non-negligible, appreciated uh, by consumers. Sensory engineering can help to better formulate a new food offer by understanding uh, of the determinant of consumer perception and liking. And to go further, it could be interesting to include, as example, uh, health and nutritional risks and benefits uh, to this product. And another perspective that we have uh, concerns the diversity of stakeholders uh, from producer to consumer that we try to integrate in the design uh, of food products. So I thank you for this presentation. I thank my colleagues <laughs> that participate to uh, all this uh, <laughs> project. Thank you, Han, for your interesting work and presentation. Congratulations. Um, we have one question from the audience. What is according to your experience, the most important issue to render more acceptable legume-based products to consumers? Uh, the main issue, <laughs> um, I think that uh, bitterness is a real, real limit uh, in the development of such products. I think that uh, for volatile uh, parts and the bini uh, uh, Bini perception and volatile composition, uh, I think it's more easy <laughs> uh, to formulate uh, food products uh, without uh, developing these Bini notes. But for bitterness, I think we have a lot of work <laughs> uh, to, to develop and to, to work on the process to, uh, to have some ingredients less bitter. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's a main issue for consumer. Okay. At okay, Anne. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Now uh, let's move on. And uh, uh, Carla. Uh, Hello. Good morning. So now we will move on to the second part of the oral communication session. And we will have the opportunity to listen to four communications. I would like to remind speakers that they can post their questions, uh, the speakers, I'm sorry, the audience that can post their questions in the YouTube chat and the speakers that they have 13 minutes to present. And then we will have two minutes of discussion of the work. So now we will start with the first pres presentation, which will be given by Maurizio Cellura entitled Environmental Sustainability in the Food Sector, the role of this life cycle assessment. Uh, Maurizio, are you ready? No, okay, Sonia Longo, maybe? Yes, good morning <laughs> to everybody. Don't worry. Uh, I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, are you able to see my screen now? Not yet, yes. Now you have okay. to put it in the presentation mode. Okay, it's okay now. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Lilian and Pascal, for the invitation and for organizing this uh, interesting uh, webinar. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to, today I'm going to introduce the life cycle assessment uh, methodology that is a tool uh, uh, for assessing the life cycle energy and environmental footprint of products. Uh, and I'm going to briefly describe some experiences on the application of LCA to food. So uh, to start, uh, we know that uh, any activity involved in the food supply chain from the cultivation uh, to the distribution and also any activity after the food consumption, for example, the disposal of uh, uh, waste food, requires uh, natural resources like, for example, uh, water uh, and energy. Uh, in particular, the food industry is uh, currently consuming 30% of the world's uh, available energy and about 70% of all water use uh, is meant for agriculture. In addition, uh, the food sector generates uh, a large amount of waste and uh, it is uh, one of the major drivers of several environmental impacts. Uh, more than one third of the global greenhouse gas emissions uh, caused by human activities uh, are uh, related uh, to the way we produce, uh, uh, process and package food. Uh, and also uh, in the European Union, the 20-30% of the environmental impacts uh, of private consumption are uh, uh, caused by uh, food and more than 50% of the eutrophication is caused by food. Uh, these numbers highlight that we need sustainable actions in the food sectors, and uh, these actions are of paramount importance for reducing uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and for fighting uh, uh, the climate change and also other environmental problems. Uh, but the question is, uh, what means sustainable from the environmental point of view uh, in general, and in particular when we talk about food? Uh, to answer this question, we need to rely on uh, scientifically reliable methods that uh, allow for uh, identifying uh, the supply chain environmental impacts, the hotspots of the whole food system life cycle uh, that allow for comparing possible alternatives and uh, that allow for avoiding uh, the burden shifting geographically, temporally, and along the supply chain. In this context, uh, the life cycle assessment methodology is widely applied by the scientific community. Uh, to analyze the energy and environmental impacts uh, of uh, the food systems supply chain uh, and to support uh, the identification of sustainable solution uh, for fighting global food challenges. LCA can be defined as a, a tool uh, for the quantification of the inputs and outputs and the related environmental impacts of a product during its uh, life cycle. And uh, we can identify different advantages of applying LCA. Uh, first of all, the methodology looks at the whole life cycle. So take, it takes into account uh, all the steps that go from the raw material supply to the end of life. In this way, looking at all the steps of the life cycle, we can avo avoid the shifting of the impacts from one life cycle step to another. In addition, uh, LCA examines uh, different aspects of the environment and uh, uh, thanks to this approach, we can prevent to move uh, uh, the environmental problems from an impact category to another. Uh, the methodology is uh, a, a robust uh, uh, tool for comparing uh, different alternatives uh, and uh, one of the mo most important things is that uh, LCA is able to show us the hidden impacts uh, uh, that uh, uh, 
uh, we can find along the supply chain or the life cycle of the product that are impact that we are not able to see when we look, uh, for example, uh, at the food product on our table. So uh, LCA uh, has different uh, advantages uh, and it is uh, widely used uh, in, part in general, but in particular also in the uh, food sector. Uh, with my research group uh, that is coordinated by Professor uh, Maurizio Cellura, we carried out different uh, uh, LCA studied, uh, studies uh, sorry, applied to food. Uh, here you can see some uh, uh, publications. And now I'm showing, uh, uh, I'm show, uh, showing some studies, uh, uh, mainly to um, highlight uh, the usefulness and the potential of the LCA for making uh, more sustainable choices. The first uh, study uh, is uh, related to the application of LCA to one kilogram of bread. In particular, we examined two scenarios. In the first one, bread is baked in a wood oven, and in the second scenario, in a methane oven. Uh, we examined the, all the steps that go from the raw material supply to the bread production, including the treatment of the processed wastes. Uh, here we can see some results uh, in terms of uh, dominance analysis, and we are able to see which are the uh, steps of the life cycle responsible of the higher impacts, and in particular, which are the inputs, the materials that can be considered dominant in the contribution to the impacts. For example, we can observe that the uh, production of the flour uh, is responsible of about uh, um, 17, 92% of the environmental impacts when we uh, take uh, into account uh, uh, the first scenario and similar percentages uh, are um, for the uh, second scenario. Uh, this means that if uh, we would like to have uh, uh, more sustainable bread, we have to uh, identify actions for improving the footprint, the environmental footprint of flour, that is the main component of bread. Um, comparing the uh, two scenarios, we can see that the contribution of uh, the uh, cooking uh, step is relevant about 45% uh, when we talk about wood uh, on the primary energy use. And this percentage increases to uh, 79% um, when, we, uh, when we move to the, uh, to the other scenario that is the use of methane. Uh, this is due not only to the amount of fuel that we need for cooking one kilogram of bread, but this is also due to the embodied energy um, uh, that is uh, consumed during the supply chain of wood and methane. If we compare the two scenarios uh, in terms of uh, energy and environmental impacts, uh, we can see that uh, the use of wood as fuel for cooking bread is uh, a more sustainable choice for most of the examined uh, uh, indicators. And in some cases, we can obtain uh, a reduction of uh, the impacts that is significant, that is higher of uh, 40%. But uh, we can observe that uh, in the case of uh, the wood oven, some uh, uh, indicators uh, um, are, uh, have uh, higher values if compared uh, with the methane oven. This indicate, uh, uh, indicates that sometimes we, can, we are not able to have a more sustainable alternative for all the examined indicators. And uh, in this uh, case, we have to uh, focus the attention on the indicators that uh, uh, have to be reduced uh, for making one choice more sustainable from all the uh, points of view in terms of envir environment. 
The second study is uh, the application of LCA to one liter of olive oil. Also in this case, we have two scenarios. The first one is the use of an aluminum can as packaging. And the second one is the use of a glass bottle as packaging. Uh, regarding the steps included in the life cycle, we examined the, all the steps that go from the olive groves cultivation to the transport of the final product to the end users. Comparing the two scenarios, in this case, we can observe that uh, the use of glass uh, packaging is better than the use of aluminum uh, packaging for all the uh, examined indicators. So in this case, we can have a clear identification of the uh, strategy that is more sustainable from the environmental point of view. Uh, recently, uh, we um, carried out a review analysis uh, on uh, all the LCA studies developed in the field of protein-rich food alternative to meat. Um, here I'm uh, showing some uh, results in terms, for example, of water use and land use during the whole life cycle of uh, different uh, food. Uh, and we immediately uh, can see that uh, the use of uh, um, food alternative to meat is uh, more sustainable uh, in this case regarding these two indicators, but in general regarding also other indicators like uh, green, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so going to the conclusions, um, we can see that uh, uh, the application of LCA to food uh, has uh, different strength points because the LCA is a tool that can be used as a metric of sustainability. Uh, in fact, uh, this methodology quantifies the use of resources and the energy related to the life cycle of a product and the environmental impacts. It uh, avoids uh, the shifting of the impacts from one life cycle stage to another and from one impact category to another. So when we make a choice based on LCA, we are sure that we are not shifting the impact. Um, the LCA uh, examines different, indi uh, different uh, indicators and uh, it can be considered as a multi-parameters environmental analysis and it can drive uh, policy makers, designers and enterprises uh, in uh, uh, eco-design strategies and uh, sustainable and also circular strategies. But there are some weaknesses points related to this uh, methodology. Uh, first of all, it is difficult to perform uh, uh, site-specific studies. And um, for this reason, we, uh, at this moment, we have not many uh, data uh, and results that are representative of, of a specific context. Um, the LCA is based on a static approach, so uh, for uh, uh, carrying out uh, uh, studies uh, uh, related to the prediction of future scenarios, we need to integrate the LCA with the other uh, tools, and we need to carry out the so-called consequential LCA studies. Um, when we use different indicators, several indicators, uh, we can have uh, results uh, that uh, uh, are uh, um, not that going not in a single uh, direction. Uh, so for making a, de a decision, uh, we need uh, to apply a multi-criteria decision model and or we need to group the indicators in a single score, but in this case, we have a loss of uh, transparency. We think that there are also some threats related to the application of the LCA and in general of the life cycle thinking approach um, to food. Um, first of all, we are not sure that uh, the socio-cultural context is ready to accept uh, this new philosophy. 
uh, or to understand this new philosophy. Uh, sometimes the available LCA studies uh, uh, are not uh, very transparent and there is a, the risk of a greenwashing. And also we have different environmental levels at this moment that can create confusion in the final consumer. So that can create confusion in the uh, um, selection of uh, uh, more sustainable products. But we think that the LCA and the life cycle perspective in general is an opportunity. Is the opportunity uh, to uh, um, uh, select and to identify strategies and actions that are based on a metric of sustainability and that take uh, into account not, not only the environmental point of view, but also the social and economic point of view, and that uh, take into account also, and in particular, the hidden impacts behind the products. So uh, it uh, could be, uh, it, it is uh, useful, it is important to uh, develop uh, new studies uh, applied uh, uh, to food in order to have more data, more results, uh, and to uh, drive uh, our uh, future diet in a more sustainable uh, direction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sonia. A wonderful presentation, wonderful topic. Uh, congratulations. Uh, we have a question. We have a question for you uh, that we uh, that was put in the YouTube channel. Uh, would you have a competitive estimation of the life cycle assessment of cereals versus legumes production chain? for instance, in terms of water and energy consumption? Uh, no, we, we have not this uh, kind of uh, data. We did not perform these uh, studies. Well, it would be in, uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, point of your work. And uh, we all know that sometimes it's, it's not possible to do everything in, in, in the same time as we perform uh, the other uh, part of the, of the work. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for being here. And uh, we will you see welcome. you in, in, in another opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good morning. You. Thank you. Okay, so now let's move on to Luisa Barreira, uh, who will present microalgae, alternative protein rich sources, and more. Whenever you. you want, Luisa. Yes, I will share my screen. Okay. Okay, so good morning to everyone. So I will be presenting um, some of the work that uh, we are doing in our group related with the application of macroalgae as an alternative protein rich uh, biomass. So uh, my group is the Marine Biotechnology Group. Uh, we are part of the Center of Marine Sciences and we are located at the University of Algarve uh, on the south of uh, Portugal. So we have been working with macroalgae for several years, and uh, these are just um, some examples of the projects that we have uh, had uh, working or uh, developing uh, new food sources um, uh, in the marine environment, uh, mainly with the uh, halophyte plants and uh, also with the uh, microalgae. So macroalgae are photosynthetic, unicellular or colonial microorganisms. Um, there are reports of, of at least uh, 30,000 species. However, uh, only around 20 species of these microalgae are industrially produced and uh, commercialized. Uh, in this figure, we have some examples of uh, macroalgae that have been uh, isolated by our group in the, in the south coast of Portugal. And we can see a huge diversity in shapes, in colors, and um, even in, in some in groups. So microalgae can be produced industrially uh, at very large scales. We are talking here maybe uh, on a scale of uh, 100 cubic meters. 
and we can find a, a great variety of uh, designs for photobioreactors. Some are closed, which are probably more appropriate to the production of a biomass that is intended for food, but we have also other uh, cheaper uh, designs of photobioreactors. Um, and in, in making a bridge we, with the, the, the previous talk, um, most of these microalgae are marine species, so they do not require fresh water. And also because they are produced in photobioreactors, they do not require um, arable lands, which are some of the advantages of the microalgae in the replacement of meat as a protein source. So microalgae have also um, other uses uh, apart from the, um, from, from the food applications. Uh, they can also be used to produce biofuels. They can also be used in um, or cultivated uh, in wastes using the, the excess nutrients of those waters. And we can, um, because they are microorganisms, do uh, a strain selection, uh, which can be based on their natural uh, diversity, but they can also be improved either by the manipulation of their uh, cultivation conditions, or we can also improve the strains using uh, genetic engineering. In terms of approximate composition and why microalgae are considered as also possible replacers of meat is based mainly on their protein content. <clears throat> and we can see here three examples of microalgae and the comparison with uh, beef or even other sources of meat like chicken. We have the fish and we have also the soya. And we can see that, for example, spirulina or chlorella can have very high uh, contents of, of protein, uh, very similar to those of, of meat. Um, this, this protein is also of uh, good quality because it contains uh, all the um, essential amino acids, uh, at least those that are uh, mentioned by the World, World Health Organization. And we can see that also the contents of the, those um, amino acids are quite good. In terms of digestibility, of course, that um, the, the digestible protein is depending on the, on the species, but it can be enhanced and it can be uh, enhanced if we uh, use this uh, biomass uh, in a context of the biorefinery. For example, if we extract the, the lipids uh, from the proteins, we are uh, in enhancing the digestibility of the, the protein. So, in a context of the biorefinery, we can use uh, all the biomass to different purposes. For example, we can use the sugars contained in the biomass to do fermentation and produce biofuels, but we can also use the lipids to do biodiesel or even better use the lipids as a source of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which this biomass is very rich in. We can also use the pigments, and then we have all the proteins and some vitamins still present in the biomass. In terms of, of, of uh, um, polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids, uh, mainly the marine microalgae, they are very rich in omega-3 fatty acids, and these have been already recognized as being very useful uh, for our, um, in, in our food. And uh, so we are now getting them to, uh, from um, marine fish, especially top predators. Um, but really the producers of those uh, omega-3 fatty acids in the fish are the marine microalgae. So why not just cut out all these middle fish and go directly to the source? So um, other uh, bioactive compounds uh, also present in this biomass are carotenoids. Um, and macroalgae can have both carotenes, like a beta-carotene, but also some carotenoids with very um, interesting uh, functions in our, uh, our uh, body as uh, antioxidants, but also being anti-inflammatory. 
Um, so microalgae can contain almost all the colors in the rainbow, um, from the oranges of beta carotene, from the blues of the phycocyanidins, from the or the reds of the astaxanthin, and the the, the yellows of of lutein, and we can manipulate these microalgae and we can modulate the concentrations that we can find of these uh, um, fatty acids and also of these pigments in the microalgae. That is species dependent, but if we look here at the effects of several stresses, we can see that when uh, we reduce the amount of nutrients, so if we put the microalgae in nutrient starvation, we almost always have an enhancement of the triacylglycerols in the biomass. This is because these elements are reserve uh, lipids, and this is where the microalgae that are put in stress because they have no nitrogen to, to multiply, and so they accumulate the uh, nutrients in, uh, in the form of um, high energy lipids. Um, however, these are not the lipids that have the highest amounts of EPA and DHA. EPA and DHA are generally, because they are highly unsaturated, are generally channeled by the, um, the cells into structural lipids like the phospholipids. That is why when we want to increase the amount of these um, fatty acids in the biomass, we usually give the cells uh, good conditions to grow, and that includes excess nitrogen. Uh, we can also see that the, the pigments have also different behaviors. Some, for example, require um, or are stimulated by um, low light conditions um, and others are stimulated by high light conditions. So these are some examples in which we uh, studied the induction of specific compounds in microalgae. In this example, we used the stimulation with high light um, and low um, nitrogen concentrations to stimulate the amount of lipids in a micro microalgae. Uh, if we compare, and uh, in here, the green dots are just the uh, lipid bodies inside the cell, say, stained with the bodipi, which is um, uh, a dye that, that specifically links to tricyl glycerols. And we can see the amount of lipid bodies uh, highly increases. And um, we can see here when we stimulate with uh, low nitrogen concentration and very high light, we have uh, a larger cell with uh, an amount of lipid bodies um, much higher than in the initial conditions. We can see here by this chart that we have reached uh, in this biomass, um, a lipid content close to 50% of, of the cell's dry biomass. Um, the same can be done in a carotenoid induction. Uh, in this case, uh, and contrary to the, what happens to the triacylglycerols, we can see that the, um, the total carotenoids are stimulated by conditions of low light, but nitrogen repletion. So we have a much um, a better content of carotenoids, specifically of beta carotene. Uh, we can see that, for example, lutein decreases in these conditions, and this is because of the different functions that these uh, two pigments have uh, on the cell. There are other types of improvements that we can perform, um, and some are for example, the, the, um, the application of specific mutations or using spontaneous mutations from the, um, the cells. So in this case, the, um, the process is based on the right selection of the desired phenotypes. Uh, in our lab, we have been using the um, fluorescence activated cell sorting coupled with flow cytometry to isolate uh, specific mutants with the desired uh, phenotypes, the desired characteristics. And we have been applying this selection 
either to um, spontaneously mutated um, strains or even trying to uh, accelerate nature and induce this mutagenesis with um, chemical mutants. The flow cytometry enables us to or helps us to detect these, um, these phenotypes because it is able to screen for the characteristics, for example, the uh, fluorescence of um, the cells one by one. And then we can even isolate these, um, uh, these mutants, these, these, um, these phenotypes in, um, in different plates or just in different wells of a 96 well plates. This is an example of um, the mutagenesis that was uh, performed on a tetracelmis species to induce the production of, uh, of um, carotenoids. And um, we can detect the carotenoids by their uh, autofluorescence. And we can see that compared with the, the wild type, so this is where we selected the, the wild type, and then because the, the, um, the fluorescence, um, we selected all the, the cells that had, had the highest fluorescence. And we can see here that we isolated two mutants. So here, the ED5 and the B11 have a much higher keratinoid production than the, the wild type. <clears throat> we can also see that this uh, um, uh, biggest amount of, uh, of carotenoids is also um, uh, maintained in, in, these, um, in these mutants, in the D5 and the B11, by uh, keeping them in stressful conditions. So uh, in this case, it would be um, uh, an increase in carotenoids, and this increase in carotenoids is usually done at the expense of chlorophyll. So, Bringing it here to our uh, subject, um, we can uh, supplement food with microalgae. The problem is that, and it's the same as with the pulses, is that we get uh, a very intense green color. And even if we put at a very small uh, percentage of um, supplementation, we can see that even just 2% of um, spirulina in, in food gives already a very intense color. And usually no one uses more than 60%. Even if we supplement uh, food that is already green, like for example, a broccoli soup with microalgae, um, at a, a very small percentage of incorporation, we get a very strong color. And what we see is that the purchase intention of the consumers decreases as we increase the amount of uh, percentage of incorporation of the microalgae. So uh, there are other uses of, of um, microalgae in food. Some species are um, not with that earthy taste and um, we can take, uh, they, they have some other um, aromas and um, other more pleasant tastes. And uh, in a collaboration with the Portuguese chef here in the Algarve, he's using uh, a species that we isolated here uh, in the coast, uh, which is a tetracelmi species that has a very intense um, flavor of shellfish. So he's using it not because of its protein content, but because of its flavor and um, properties. And he's using it just to enhance the flavor of um, fish related um, plates or with um, this tetracelmis to give it a more intense marine uh, flavor. Um, we can work also on these organoleptic characteristics if we, if we change a bit the cultivation, some species of microalgae can be grown uh, mixotrophically or heterotrophically. So autotrophically, we would use just the supplementation within organic uh, carbon, CO2. But if we supply an organic uh, carbon, um, uh, we can also produce and have it grow, growing um, even in the absence of, of light. 
of course, in the absence of flights, um, the uh, micro microalgae tend to lose some of the, their chlorophyll contents and they have a more a lighter green color, which may be more uh, attractive to, to consumers. For example, uh, this is a Portuguese company, All Microalgae, that is uh, producing um, chlorella in fermenters. And when produced in the dark, the chlorella has this more lime color and uh, it can be, it is called the smooth chlorella vulgaris. Um, but we can also apply uh, the uh, mutagenesis to get uh, even lighter uh, colors in, in, um, in chlorella. So um, when we uh, um, apply a chemical mutagen to, to, the, to this, uh, we have not a GMO because the, the, we are not introducing uh, any different genes in, uh, into this biomass. We are creating natural mutants. And if we select the, the mutants with a survival rate of around 10% of these, um, of these mutants and then plate and incubate in the dark, we are uh, promoting the growth of the uh, mutants that have lower chlorophyll, but that are able to use uh, other carbon sources. So in this case, we were able to um, get uh, yellow chlorella, lime chlorella, and even a white chlorella. What is very interesting in these cases is that chlorophyll acts as a, um, a nitrogen sink. And if these um, species do not produce any chlorophyll, all the nitrogen is diverted to protein pr uh, production. And we can see that this white chlorella has a much higher protein content than the, the um, chlorella wild type. Uh, these um, chlorellas are already in the market and uh, Alma is already producing this uh, honey chlorella. Of course, because they have no chlorophyll at all, they have to be um, produced by fermentation, um, but it's uh, already uh, selling. And um, because they have not a green color, the applications and the incorporation into foods is much more easier. There are still some challenges, of course. Um, the production is still quite expensive um, and uh, only a few species are approved by the EU. So microalgae are considered as novel food. And- uh, I'm Sorry, Louisa, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, one minute, please. Okay, we are passing- I'm, I'm, I'm on my last slide. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. And we have to work, of course, on the acceptance by uh, the consumers. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Louise. And I'm sorry for interrupting you. Um, we thought that you were that you were uh, still uh, presenting. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you for your presentation. Very nice talk. Uh, we love your work. Uh, it's 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 very interesting and very um, uh, straight to the point uh, to the subject of this webinar. Um, Louisa, we have a question for you uh, on the YouTube chat. It is more sustainable for the environment than fish production. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, um, there are several people working on the LCA of microalgae production. So um, there is, of course, the, the benefits of not requiring uh, arable land and of not uh, requiring fresh water if we are talking about the marine species. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if we are looking at, uh, at microalgae as a source of protein and as a source of uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, then uh, yes, I would say that is um, better for the environment than mm -hmm. fish production. And, and what about the bioresidues from the production of this microalgae? Can you, uh, these, uh, the production uh, of microalgae produces bioresidues or some type of residues? Uh, the water that is used to produce the microalgae can be uh, recycled. So oh, okay. we, can, we can really recirculate the water mm -hmm. back to the, um, to the photobioreactors and just add more nutrients. Part of also the, um, the sustainability came, comes also for the possibility of using wastewater uh, 
um, to produce. There are some wastewaters coming from industrial residues mm -hmm. that are relatively clean and that can be used for the production of, uh, of biomass to, to be used as food. In terms of, of uh, residues from the, the biomass, um, because there are so many applications for all the, the biochemical constituents of the biomass, we can really limit the amount of residues. So even if we extract the proteins, which will increase the digestibility of, of the protein, we can still use the remaining biomass as a source of fibers, as a source of carbohydrates, yeah. pigments, vitamins. Mm -hmm. So there are several applications uh, possible. And advantages, there are many advantages. Uh, I think it's- I like to think work. so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Luisa. Congratulations Thank on you. your work and um, and uh, good luck for the next stages for, for this work. Thank you so much. Bye. So now we will have Isabel Ferreira talking about the reuse of brewing byproducts to produce protein-rich ingredients for food industry. Hello, I will share my screen. Okay. Sorry, I think that you are not seeing. We are seeing it, yes, but not in the presentation not mode. The, the version, I don't know why, because I am trying to have a presentation mode. Sorry. Um, I suppose that it's because I have two screens I don't maybe yes <laughs> maybe this, because i tried previously and it was everything okay i don't know why luisa put a ocultar visit vista do apresentador sorry <laughs> yeah, é ocultar vista do apresentador. Because I have, I am sharing the screen, uh, but when I try to use the presentation mode, it appears in the other screen that I am not sharing. Try to do it again, like you were doing. Now I have, uh, you are seeing my slides. Yes, but it's not in presentation. It's presentation view. But when I include presentation view, I think that I will try another possibility. I will have it in presentation view previously. I think now we're seeing the two computers because we can see the presentation mode behind the PowerPoint that you are showing now. Sorry. Uh, okay, this is normal technical problems. Uh, I don't know why. I think that I will close. Sorry, I think that don't. It is the same. You yes. see? Yeah. Yes, but go to the three dots, um, Isabel. Yes. Click it, click there, please. And go ocultar vista ah, do apresentador. This? Yes. And now. No. I think you have to present it like this if you don't mind. I I don't know why. I don't know why also, but uh, uh, sorry, if I can help you, you can click on the icon. I think that you like now I, it's the same. Yes, that, okay. that's okay. 
Now it's good, is it? Yes, it's good. It's good. I don't know what is the difference. Sorry, but I am no stress. It. It's okay, Isabel. <laughs> okay, so uh, sorry for this first because I have tried in my Zoom link before I started, but it was everything okay. So I will talk about the reuse of viewing byproducts to produce protein-rich ingredients uh, for uh, food industry. I am from the University of Porto in the north of Portugal and from the research center uh, Requint. Uh, so, uh, only, um, sorry, but when I go to the next slide, I think that you don't see it. Oh, it's not okay. You, you are seeing the same slide. Yes. When I change, ah, sorry. Because you were seeing only the screen, the you must see the screen. Oh, I think that I know the problem now. Now we are seeing the second yes, slide. It's okay. Yes, okay. Yes, yes, okay. Second, <laughs> I understand now the problem. Okay. So, uh, sorry, but uh, only briefly, the, what's the plan for this presentation? So, I will do a very brief uh, uh, summary of the relevance of byproducts valorization. Uh, I will focus on the whole of this work that is. Uh, about the recovery of protein rich ingredients from brewing byproducts. I will only talk about the brewer spent yeast because the time is short for the presentation. Uh, and I will uh, show some examples and uh, uh, make a, a summary about the scientific and industrial challenges that we face uh, to do the recovery of those products and finally a take home message. So, as we are all aware, uh, food security, safety and sustainability is a major challenge of our time because the world population is increasingly increasing, mainly due to the increase of population in developing countries and feeding the world population in the future uh, will continue to be a challenge. Uh, nutrient recycling from the industry uh, is a growing industry to valorize byproducts that can be rich in nutrients. Uh, and this, this is the case of the protein, the valorization, waste valorization, uh, of the protein fraction of those byproducts. So, uh, brewing industry, the two main products from brewing, brewing industry are the spent grain and the spent yeast. The spent yeast is less abundant, uh, but it's a rich source of nutrients mainly proteins that are the focus of my presentation, but also contain vitamins, minerals and fiber. So they can be a source of functional ingredients. And those functional ingredients are interesting to reduce, for example, the risk of chronic diseases uh, that is, goes by under their nutritional functions as a protein rich nutrient. However, there are several drawbacks. This recovery emerged in the big, at the beginning of this center, this uh, uh, 21st century, uh, and the major drawbacks that the industry faced to continue the recovery and to increase the recovery is the insufficient biological stability of those byproducts, the stabilization procedure that are needed to obtain the functional ingredients and that are, uh, uh, they need require money and uh, costs. And uh, 
the bioactivity needs more studies, not only in vitro studies, but also in vivo studies to uh, be sure that it is uh, uh, scientifically based. When we talk about those proteins and those properties, uh, we are told of the proteins, they are mostly from bioactive peptides that they contain that can be obtained by autolysates or protein hydrolysates. And they are properties like uh, inhibitory effects of angiotensin converting enzyme, that it's good to control the hypertension, or other activities such as antioxidant activity, anti-inflammatory activity. So uh, these nutritional properties must be studied to see if the digestion uh, maintains those properties in the body. So, uh, when we talk, uh, sorry, uh, the goals of this work, when we talk about valorization of these uh, byproducts, especially focused in spent yeast, uh, we talk about the extraction of the protein fraction and the obtention of ingredients that can, besides the properties that are health properties, they can be uh, good for the industry because they have uh, emulsifying properties, jellifying properties, uh, or aroma, for example, uh, uh, aroma like meat uh, taste. So uh, I will show the goal is this one, focused in the uh, brewer spent yeast. Uh, and I will show some examples that we have performed uh, in the projects that we are running in our laboratory. Uh, as I said, Brewer Spent East is rich in proteins, but also contains fiber and beta-glucan from the cell wall of the East is very useful for the industry, also because of the pro uh, lowering cholesterol lowering properties. The another disadvantage as disadvantage we can uh, highlight the fact that it contains a higher uh, bitterness if they are from the industry due to the hop addition to the beer, uh, and they also contain uh, uh, RNA that uh, in great amounts can uh, be not so good as an ingredient, so it should be uh, controlled their content. Uh, the recovery of those uh, proteins from yeast can be done by mechanical processes or by chemical solvents. Uh, the use of mechanical uh, disruption of the cell wall to separate the cell wall, the beta glucans from the cell walls and the inner content that is the rich part of pro uh, that is rich in proteins. Uh, if it is done by mechanical disruption, it should be refrigerated to avoid the increase of temperature that can damage the constituents of the, the yeast. Uh, this process can be done at the laboratory and at the industry with the appropriate equipment. And we can obtain protein concentrates that have uh, different proteins, as we can see here in the analysis that we have performed of the inner content of the yeast cell. Concerning the amino acid composition, uh, in the, as previously was explained for algae, also for yeast we have uh, good scores, chemical scores, that indicate that uh, the amino acid profile uh, supplies the amino acids, essential amino acids uh, in the proportions that we need for the health, as we can see here, because we have a chemical score higher than one for uh, most uh, for the, all the amino, essential amino acids. Additionally, we have measured antioxidant and anti uh, the ACE inhibitory properties of those extracts and uh, I talk about the extracts from the inner part of the co uh, protein concentrate or protein rich part of the yeast that we separated. And we evaluate that uh, properties along uh, three months to uh, evaluate their stability. 
we concluded that it keeps the stability during those, this period, except one property that is also can be useful for the industry, that is the proteolytic activity. Uh, though if we work with a mechanical separation of those extracts and we maintain the refrigerated conditions, we can maintain the proteolytic properties of those yeast extracts. Uh, after we lyophilize the product and we do the analysis of the proteolytic activity and uh, we observed a decrease after six months uh, but the, all the other properties that we measured were maintained constant. Additionally, we uh, produ uh, produced autolysates under mild conditions, uh, and we used in vitro methods to uh, study the absorption of the peptides from those autolysates. We simulated the intestinal barrier with a monolayer of CACO2 cells, and we simulated the intestinal lumen and the digestion of those autolysates using InfoGest methodology. That is a standardized methodology, static methodology for simulating digestion. And we measured by liquid chromatography the profile of peptides that we have in the apical uh, transwell inserts and in the basolateral compartment. And we observed that using uh, this monolayer with CACO2 cells mainly, but also uh, simulating the H29 cells, a small amount of the scoculture, and we observed that uh, in the basolateral part we have a similar peptide profile, and also we maintain that bioactive properties. Uh, we also studied the possibility of using solvents, not mechanical extraction, but chemical extraction with sodium hydroxide, uh, and we obtained good results with the, the separation, we te tested two different conditions uh, with room temperature and uh, higher temperature. Uh, this condition with wood, wood, uh, room temperature was uh, better uh, because we have two different extracts, one in the liquid fraction that contains 25% of proteins and a very small portion of uh, beta-glucans from the cell wall. This fraction has emulsifying properties, uh, very good emulsifying properties uh, that are stable at low concentrations and also jellifying properties at higher concentrations. Uh, the solid fraction uh, has uh, lower protein content, but it has the, advantages of, the advantage of higher beta-glucan content and also presents emulsifying and jellifying properties. Why we are applying those extracts because they have um, a, a, another an aroma like uh, meat. So we are using applying those uh, extracts in different uh, quantities to the incorporation in uh, uh, industry uh, meat industry products with the advantages of replace part of the proteins and part of the carrageenans that these industries use for meat products, and also to lower the salt amount, because um, although we remove initially part of the nucleotides content, uh, some nucleotides are also maintained, and these are, um, they have the property that uh, increase the salt perception of those products. Uh, so, uh, so some scientific challenges were overcome in our studies, but uh, we also we still have a lots of uh, points to study uh, in this project because uh, the safety, uh, not only the chemical safety, but microbiological and allergenicity of those uh, extracts is being studied, uh, and also it is important. Uh, 
to use those ingredients that are rich in proteins to create new textures for foods and after to study the consumer's acceptance. Because we are using the recovery of uh, byproducts, and uh, when consumers know that is from a byproduct, something that is going to waste, uh, the acceptance is not always so good. So this is something that we must still work. Uh, so to, to continue uh, the use of the, these products, in this case at an industrial scale, uh, there are still some challenges that we need uh, to overcome to be sure that it is a successful pro uh, product, uh, namely the microbiological the safety of those products, the industrial efficiency, because here I didn't have time to focus, but we have different efficiency if it is a mechanical or a chemical process, uh, and also to um, large scale safety and quality is also a major challenge. So finally, uh, the take home message, um, this uh, uh, process that we have tested showed that uh, new food ingredients were obtained uh, that we are incorporating in foods from brewer spent yeast. Uh, they have good nutritional properties. Uh, peptides absorption on the gastrointestinal tract was also test, was only tested in vitro, but uh, it is promising. But uh, in vivo studies are required. Uh, and we are now trying the scaling up at an industrial level because this is still a challenge uh, to have big amounts of this uh, um, ingredients and see if they maintain the same quality as we obtained at the uh, lab. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the initial problems in the uh, sharing of this screen. Thank you so much, Professor Isabel. It's so normal. It's, uh, it's more normal than when everything goes, uh, goes well and everything is okay, so don't worry. It was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your work. It's, it's wonderful. We have a question for you on the YouTube chat. Um, are there sensorial issues of the flavors concerning brewing byproducts, especially protein-rich fractions? Yes, there are some uh, um, sensorial issues when we talk about it. And the first one is uh, that is important, the debittering process, the initial uh, uh, debittering process. That is simple, only done with water. But um, the brewing industry uses hop to uh, have the bitter taste of mm -hmm. beer. And that will be in the yeast, the extract. So the first part, uh, consumers don't appreciate that bitter taste mm -hmm. in yeah. meat products, for example. Mm -hmm. So it must be removed. This is uh, due to the presence of alpha, iso alpha acids and alpha mm -hmm. acids. In mm -hmm. general, that are uh, we can solubilize them in water. So this is the, the first issue. But also the proteins. Some peptides they have a bitter taste. Mm -hmm. So uh, the conditions that we do the extraction will influence uh, the formation of those bitter peptides that must be removed. Mm -hmm. The good thing is that uh, the products that we are tasting that. Uh, are, for example, to replace the meat from the products like ham, for example, that nowadays are very appreciated. And the bitter, the taste of meat, the meat taste, mm -hmm. is a characteristic of those extracts. So if they are appropriately manipulated and yeah. selected, we can use them, the, the good part of the sensory characteristics of those extracts. Yeah, because the hop cannot be removed from the beer production. So it's, uh, yes. or or the, the producer choose a beer for, with a, um, a less bitter taste of hopper, or else you do not have the, the, the manner to, to remove the hop from the production of the beer. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, you have a, it's a problem that you have to solve 
afterwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Isabel. If you have a, another questions after your presentation, uh, we will send you from the, okay. with the chat here in Zoom link. Thank you so much, and we will see you in the next time. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Bye. Thank you. And now to close this session, we will move with um, Francesco Porcelli and the presentation arguments in alternative protein rich food source choices. Are insects available? Not, yes. Now, nice to see you all. I try to share my screen. Not sure to be able, but how to see it. Let's go. Okay, it's okay. Screen. Do you see the presentation or not? Yes, we see it perfectly. So thank you very much for the opportunity and was really interesting to follow the previous presentation. I will try to be a little bit more concentrated as, as time because I understand that we are a little bit late. So what do we are speaking about? We are speaking about um, a fair old interaction between humans and insects. Uh, and the insect usually was the, the winning part of the story, but sometimes we was able to eat them and so to get some advantage from the story. One of the advantages of the story is that usually the insect body is much well compartmentalized. And so we can discriminate easily fat that is yellow in this picture, muscles that are white, milky white, and other components like cuticle or mid-gut or uh, other organs that the insect had, um, but sure, maybe not so interesting for us. So the message is that um, insects are complicated with a, a tremendous and extreme biodiversity, and we must be cautious choosing the proper insect to eat on, especially in a um, non in a tribal uh, social context in which uh, ever, everything that will not kill you will anyway save you. We, we can choose among uh, and between uh, species, plant feeding species that appears to be uh, more safe than the species thriving on detrite or more complicated or sarcosaprophagous species thriving on body or carcasses. Sure, the um, associated microorganism in case of the last two um, steps um, um, will, will complicate the story of using insect for food. One more uh, aspect is that um, uh, much of the insect we may use or we are using for as food can be can be differently viable depending on their step in development. This is in particular is true for the balance between proteins and fats. There are there are insects that are in some way fermented. I will show you later, soon later, a couple of pictures. But uh, basically, young instars of insects, I mean larvae, have much fat and adults uh, have uh, much protein in comparison. But there is a point of equilibrium. The point uh, is, in my opinion, um, at the pupa st um, step. Uh, if you can imagine a butterfly, you know, caterpillar, so caterpillars, then pupa, these immotile steps, and then you have adult. In the pupa, we, we, we can see here, in larva, we have muscles, fat, and good content. That is not a secondary problem, because when we try to use insects for food, we also, we get what they have in the gut, lumen. In this intermediate step, that is a prepupa, uh, gut is uh, start involving, and so we have just to do with fat and proteins. But in pure pupa, much of the fat will be elaborated, so we have a percentage major content in proteins. So uh, the choice of the step to manage, to use, to produce proteins for, for food is also relevant. Here you see the, the well-known Mopane worms. They are caterpillars from Saturnid in, I mean, Central Africa. And they are traded, today are traded in, in Europe uh, in these um, plastic bags. And in plastic bags closed, some fermentation of course, also because they are boiled and dried under the sun. 
you can imagine which kind of event or sorry of eventual um, microbiological impact may have this kind of food on on uh, on, on men in different parts of the world they they are not dangerous i i hope i mean that i i tested there was not but we cannot exclude that that a so simple way to manage this uh, mini livestock uh, will, will or may impact the on the on the um, population because if the consumption is is scarce even the problem will be scarce enough not to be detected but if, if one consumption grows up um, problems may, may rise. Um, uh, on the other side of the coin, one species uh, has been domesticated by humans, and it is also used for food, but in the step of a pupa, because pupa of silkworm, this is silkworm, the silkworm is a fully domesticated species, and maybe is the only fully domesticated insect species we have. But uh, pupae are, are a byproduct of silk production. Uh, and they are a valuable, interesting source of proteins and also fats, of course. But mm, proteins uh, is, the main, is the main component. Uh, and also the, um, the economy of the use of, of silk and pupae can be made circular easily enough. And today also there is an interesting approach to the silkworm, even not um, typically to produce silk, but to produce technological material connected or starting from silk production. Um, I, I can say today if the, this will be economic, but the relevance of the silkworm poop as source of protein is stay untouched because it's many, in many countries of the East, where silkworm is still produced, this byproduct is, is interesting and, um, and much used. I was in China a few years ago, and they sell poop of uh, the, the bombix mori, I mean, the true silkworm, but also of uh, other species of silkworm, named the Anterea perni, that are bigger and are used to produce silk of a secondary quality. So they integrated the uh, seed production with food, food gathering for, uh, for families. Um, in the demonstration that, uh, and the relevance for, uh, to have been treating a fully domesticated species uh, rise because uh, we don't know um, silkworm in nature. We have this Theophila mandarina Theophila mandarina bombix that is uh, wild in China, and there are many points of contact with silkworm. Uh, but the main characters that made breeding easy is that if you don't feed the silkworm, they will stay there till they die of, by starvation. So they will not escape. Consequently, the breeding of the silkworm is very, very, very easy in comparison with different insects, they will uh, go away, will escape if they miss some, some food or, or, or some uh, uh, environmental um, request. Another argument that is interesting is the presence of valuable source of proteins in different parts of the insects, mainly typically head is full of muscles and nervous system, nervous neurons here. So the, the head is a sure a concentrate of valuable products, valuable matter. But it is not true for all, all insects in all instars for the other part of the body. Here you see dissected, properly dissected um, scarab larva, and you can see this big mass, and you can can easily imagine maybe 50% of the volume of the larva is made by ingested food that the, the larva is elaborating. So this is near to be fishes. And here in the mid gut, you can, you can see, or better, you can imagine that uh, amount of, um, I mean, soil and uh, plant organic matter in, during decayment, uh, that is the main uh, 
the main food of this larva. Sure, you cannot consider such a kind of larva as a source of protein in, this, in our world, in our, in our uh, West world. In some region of the world, nevertheless, these larvae are eaten. And this may pose a big question mark about the opportunity or the, or the security of this food. There are further topics that are relevant. The case is that of uh, superworms, the so-called uh, zoophobus or morio worm. They are big tenebrionid, dark in beetle. They have a funny characteristic that is the, they will not uh, pass to adult if larvae are abundant and touch them each other. So this is interesting because we can, on the side of industrial uh, production, we can modulate the, um, the instar of interest, that is larva or pupa, but mainly, mainly larva, because the zoophobus is trade as larva. Uh, so inducing the, um, the presence of adults, when we need to recycle, restart the cycle of production. And this is interesting because uh, uh, otherwise we are subject to the, um, the wheels of the insect, the tiny insects, and uh, on the side of mass production, mass breeding, um, this often creates difficulties. Just to see you, this is the phobias uh, that have been used from the, for, the, for food. And you can appreciate uh, by boiling, uh, because boiling them will, uh, will force them to linearize. So they can like, tread like, so to, their body will, uh, will, uh, will stop uh, bent or, or uh, swing uh, to become linear. You can see the larvae are almost all of the same size, despite the time during the breeding. This is interesting from the point of view of post uh, management of this larvae or, or of uh, working on getting proteins, fats, because it is a, is a kind of pieces that we can imagine like uh, um, industrial product. So no problem with different age in the breeding and, and consequently uh, they will be really manageable during transformation, following transformation. Uh, one of the last um, points that is still unsolved is the presence of uh, cuticle, because we, we all know that ketin also contains an amount of uh, um, nitrogen, but uh, as it is, uh, um, is almost not available during digestion by humans. We know maybe... Uh, oaks, they can get cat, they can catch uh, cricket for food and similar, but cuticle parts still remain untouched and we can find later in features or in adjusted or other adjusted. So cuticle is a still unexplored source of nitrogen or less explored, but, but may be interesting to explore it because all insects anyway have cuticle. So maybe a further source of nitro, organic nitrogen to include or not in evaluation of, for the production. And finally, this is my son, Sergio. And, and believe it or not, uh, we will eat insects because at the point we'll be, we will be hungry enough. So, so thank you very much for your time. And I don't know what exactly I have to do. Thank oh, you so sorry. much, Dr. Francesco. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it was very interesting, and uh, it's uh, a topic that uh, that it's now beginning to to be increasingly talk due to the need. I'm sorry. Of the... I'm sorry. It's lunchtime. Hope no one. No. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. It will not cause any any problem with my appetites. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, Dr. Francesco, in our let me see if in our YouTube channel we have a question for you. Well.
unfortunately, unfortunately not, but I have a question for you. So it's like uh, um, the science, it's unquestionable. So we, I, I will not talk to you about this. I'm very, I'm more concerned about the social aspects of this work. So what's your opinion about the general opinion of the consumers today about um, using this type of sources as alternative for the protein um, in our food? Okay, I'm, I'm lucky enough because I've had the opportunity to organize two meetings with dinner, insect-based dinners. So uh, there is interest, especially because uh, rarely we eat insects as they are. They are included in preparation. Yeah. And in preparation, um, I was really astonished because even a person of uh, 70, 75, 80 years was, was curious and they went to test. Mm -hmm. So curiosity may be a good driver, a good vehicle to jump on and to, to go. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there are parts of the world that they are uh, already from centuries now that they have already uh, introduced in their basis diet, some type you're, of insects right. in their food, so. You're right, but uh, what we are looking at and for is uh, um, something to be included in industrially safely produced food. Yeah. That part of the world that uses insects as mini livestock. Mm -hmm. So they use occasionally, and depending on the season, depending on the needs, and sure they are gathered from, from a tree or on the way. So uh, on the side of food safety, it leave me, I mean, um, a little bit, uh, I don't know, not, not yeah. sure. Yeah, and so uh, uh, just a fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in industry, we can also add a step uh, that, the, that consists in the opportunity to overcharge those insects to use for food production mm -hmm. with some, something special just before to, to manage them and to use them. Mm -hmm. So because their attitude to fit some something, I mean, will, will result in including relevant components in the in their composition. Mm -hmm. And so this composition may enhance or uh, ameliorate the final products we, go, we, we are going to do on industrial base. I mean, we need the insects as, as a, I mean, basic prime matter to do something. Mm -hmm. And it's completely different from that humans do on the way when they get something to, to eat on. Okay, so that's the, fun, that's the main issue to be addressed in this topic, in the sure. use of, uh, of insects as a protein source. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Francesco. A well, wonderful communication. Uh, good luck for the rest of your work. And I hope we can interact in another occasion with you and the other speakers of, of this session. It will be my pleasure for sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Me and Carla were, were very, very enthusiastic about these oral communications. Thank you so much uh, for the, um, or the, all the communicators for today's session. We will return at um, uh, two thirty seat time. I think. Let me just check. Yes, uh, fourteen thirty CET time with um, with the topic bioactive ingredients in food. Hope you enjoy this morning session. Hope you enjoy the afternoon session. We will see you in just a bit. Thank you so much.